Robin Neumann. Yes. <laughs> How are you? When my parents would introduce myself, like, this is Robin, she's the swimmer, I'm like, I'm more than that. Like, I'm, I'm someone else too. I've really had to learn to live in the moment much more and just like live in the present and be okay with whatever happens at this point rather than reminiscing about the past or worrying too much about the future. I just want to live much more in the present and be happy with what I'm doing rather than only worrying or being anxious about things I can't control or things that have happened and I can't change anyway or can't copy paste again in the future and never change the past and the only way you can change the future is by doing something right now. My purpose in life is to leave my dent in the universe in absolutely everything I do, as well as to inspire and help others do the same. For someone to leave their dent in my life is a privilege. For me to leave my dent in someone else's life is an honor. But to inspire and help others leave their own dent in the universe is an indescribable feeling. I plan on doing this through this podcast by celebrating my guests and inspiring my listeners, all while leaving my own dent in the universe and helping others do the same. My name is Fer Andrade, and this is Denting. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to another episode of Denting. I am your host, Fernando Andrade, and today I have a very special guest in front of me. Good vibes right now, and I told you I just wanted to get this started because the conversation was already good. Robin Neumann. Yes. <laughs> How are you? I'm good. I'm good. How are you? Very good. Super excited about this. Yeah, thanks um, for having me. Thanks for coming on. Uh, I, like I just said, we were starting to get the conversation yeah. going and I was like, yep, we, I should definitely start recording. Um, so for starters, would you like to introduce yourself for those that may not know you? Yeah, so my name is Robin Neumann. Um, it's funny, it took a while for Calathletics to get that right because I'm technically... When people ask me where I'm from, I say I'm from Europe because it's a pretty long answer. But I was born in Paris um, and have lived in about seven different countries. So, But my last name is Austrian because my mom is Dutch, my dad is Austrian. So it took a while for people to catch on to the Neumann. But at one point, I almost started introducing myself as Newman because <laughs> I was like, you know what, well, never mind. <laughs> people weren't catching on. But um, yeah, I'm a just newly graduated um, yesterday, actually. Um, I'm on the women's swimming team, or was, actually just finished, and a global studies major and a human rights minor, so Awesome, <laughs> awesome. That, that's why I love um, starting with, like, your self-introduction, just to get a sense yeah. of, like, who you introduce yourself as, yeah. but, but that's awesome. The first thing I will say is that Wikipedia has it wrong. Wikipedia says you were born in Munich. That, okay. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know who made that, but um, I did live in Munich. So there's something right there. But yeah, I was born in Paris. I only lived there for about six months. Okay. Um, and then, yeah, Paris, Frankfurt, Germany, then moved to Stockholm, then moved to London, Munich, and then Amsterdam, and then Berkeley. And moving back to Amsterdam in about a month. So Yeah, yeah. I, I did see that. That's why I was curious as well. I was like, where are you from? Yeah. I think Europe is a very accurate It's a loaded answer. question. Yeah. I'm like, oh, no, not this question. But I always I always say I'm European with a Dutch mother and an Austrian father. That's my simple answer. So, yeah. <laughs> yep. And citizenship-wise, you're Austrian and Dutch, right? Yeah, so I have dual passports. But I, for the past 10 years, have been representing the Netherlands swimming-wise. So at one point, I kind of had to make a choice. And Holland was, or the Netherlands, there's technically two names for the country. But the Netherlands is the correct way Um that's who I represented swimming wise internationally. So, yep. Out of curiosity, what's the difference between Netherlands and Holland? Ooh, that's a good question. Um, I would say Austria is pretty traditional and much more, it's a lot about nature and like traditional, but the Netherlands is a pretty, I think, more progressive country in some sense. But swimming wise, the Netherlands is just better. Um, and they had more opportunities for me. And we were moving to the Netherlands anyway. So I was like, might as well represent the country I'm living in right now. So. Yeah, that was cool. I, I meant, sorry, I meant mostly like with the names Netherlands oh, and, and, and Holland. Holland. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I'm sorry, sorry, I, sorry I, Austria. No, you're good. I know it has to do with history and like yeah, the so grouping of the nation. Technically, but... the Netherlands used to be called like the Seven Kingdoms because it was like seven parts. And Holland, I don't know when we changed to the Netherlands, but I do know they recently like scrapped the name Holland and was like, everyone, please call it the Netherlands now. But it's kind of a mouthful sometimes. But um, yeah, it's, I think it's just history. Okay. Yeah, historical. Yeah, and I'm so good at saying you're Dutch. Yes. Okay. Yes. So it's Holland, the Netherlands, but then Dutch. <laughs> okay. And we speak Dutch. So. <laughs> yes. Yeah. There we go. Yep. Um, besides that, in terms of like where you're from with, with all yes. of this, um, 
how was your experience moving literally from city to city? Like I had it down where you were in six, living in six different cities, six different countries, but it's seven cities, six countries. Yeah. So what's that experience like? What stages of your life were, were each one in? Yeah. Um, I, I would, now I look at it and I'm like, I'm really grateful it happened, but in the middle of it, I was like, oh, God, I'm moving again. <laughs> I don't want to, because every time it would be a new language. So that, I think, was the toughest part, having to learn a new language. My mom always spoke Dutch with me, and my dad always spoke German to me, but I never spoke it back. So technically, German was my first language, but then I completely lost it when we moved to England, because then I grew up in London and just started speaking English. And then we moved to Germany, had to co totally like relearn German in an educational setting. And I'd never like written a word of German or read it. So that was really tough. Um, I remember getting my first like exam back and it was just like fully marked and read. I was like, oh, God, I'm not passing. <laughs> and so that was stressful. And then we moved to the Netherlands and I was like, OK, I have to do it all over again. But German and Dutch are pretty similar. So that does help. Um, but yeah, it was it was tough, I would say, especially when we moved to Munich. My parents were like, OK, this is where we're staying and so I like really started setting up like a foundation and then it just gets uprooted again. But I would say it has told me to be super like versatile. It's like opened up my mind. Um, I would say I'm good at like adjusting to new scenarios. So that definitely helped when I moved to Berkeley. Um, but yeah, I'd moved at this point, I'd moved like 12 times and I was like, you know what, let me just move across the world again. Yeah. <laughs> or for the first time actually to something that wasn't Europe. But yeah, I wanted a new challenge. I think the reason I did that too is because I'm so used to moving around. I'd been in Amsterdam for about six years and I was like, eh, it's time for something new. So that's part of the reason why I started like looking to come to America. Yeah. yeah. Like, and for context, take me through like the ages. The like, ages. You were in Paris six, six months. Six months. Then Frankfurt was, um, I want to say like about a year and a half short. Sweden, uh, Stockholm was about two years, I want to say. London was six, but we lived in three different cities. We lived in London, then moved outside of London, moved back to London. And then Munich was two and a half years. Amsterdam, I moved to Amsterdam in 2011, like a context. So at this point, I was 13 um, and then did my whole high school in Amsterdam. So that was the longest period I've ever been in one place is six years. So Wow. Yeah. But even then, moved to three different houses. So That's yeah. crazy. <laughs> Can I ask why you guys move so much? I'm assuming that has yeah, to do with your parents' My work. dad's job. Okay. Yeah, so he works in the hospitality industry, um, became the CEO of, like, a hotel group, and he just kept, like, climbing up the ladder and getting promoted, and then we would have to move jobs. So, or move... He moved jobs, we moved places. So that's kind of what it was, yeah. Interesting. Yeah. Yeah. And at this point in your life right now, how many languages are you comfortable with? I'm fluent in three and speak a bit of French. So I took two semesters here at Cal. <laughs> it definitely helped, but I do want to be able to say that I speak French given I was born in Paris um, and it will help down the line with what I want to do. Like the diplomacy world is in French, a lot of it. So I want to be able to speak French. So I'm working on that, but I'm fluent in three. So English, Dutch and German. Yeah, yeah. that's insane. Yeah. <laughs> that's so sick. Yeah, I can, I mean, I can relate a tiny bit okay. to what you're saying with the yeah. languages because when I, I mean, I was born in San Diego, yeah. like I told yeah. you, but to Mexican parents. Okay. So the when people ask me what my first language was, I mean, definitely speaking Spanish to my parents, yeah. but they would just, like, everything on TV that I was watching was in English. Yeah, yeah. So, it helps. No, it helps TV's a, lot. a big part. Like, I remember watching uh, Teletubbies in German. Like, <laughs> and then would have my mom speaking to me in Dutch, and then whenever we were together as a family, it would be English. So it was just like... I call it Denglish with my sister. We call we speak Denglish because it's like half of my sentences in English, half of it is in Dutch. There's some German sayings in there. And past 10 p.m., that's when my languages just get all muddled up because I get so tired. I think my brain is just just gives up. So <laughs> then everything just goes to Denglish pot. Yep. <laughs> yeah, I mean yeah. for for us definitely Spanglish exists. Sp yes. <laughs> it has it. a very like that's very Californian. Yeah. Okay. Um again, because of yeah. the history. I don't know if you know, but like California was part of Mexico yeah. originally yeah. and things like that. So Spanglish does exist. It has a very negative connotation. My parents would get okay. pissed off okay. if, if I do that. Um and I, I'm kind of annoyed at it as well, but my friends do it a lot. Yeah. So yeah. It's, I, it's nice. You could just like pick and choose from different languages. I think it's fun. Um, and we make our own little language that way in my family. But it's interesting that it has a negative connotation. Yeah. At least in California, well, to, just to, for context, I kind of live like in a border city. Yeah. Not kind of, it is a border city. Okay. So I'm between both cities, Got not it. even kidding, every single day. Wow. So I'm going back home tomorrow. Yeah. 
and home is San Diego. Yeah. But right now my parents live in Mexico in the border city oh, right wow. there. Okay. So I cross the border every day. Wow. But it's normal. Like, it's not that's a big cool. deal. That's cool, though. Yeah. <laughs> that's super cool. <laughs> so, so that's wow. why there's, like, that connotation yeah. to it. Like, okay. you moved around from country to yeah. country. And for yeah. me, it's, like, every single day yeah. I'm in two Just countries. Country, cr- crossing country. I'm going to the other country today. <laughs> See, it, 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 it sounds weird when I explain it yeah. to people at Cal. But back home. It's normal. I have that bubble. Like, yeah. it, it's weird, again, explaining this to people. Because I was just talking to... Um, one, one of the girls that lives upstairs, and she's from London, but born in Madrid. Okay. And we were just talking, and she's like, but you're Mexican. I'm like, no, I'm American. Yeah. And she's like, well, Mexican-American. And I, I had to explain, yeah. like, it's a very small cultural yeah. bubble yeah. of people that are there and back yeah. every single day. That's interesting. So, wow. Yeah. That's pretty cool. <laughs> it, it is interesting, yeah. yeah. I, okay I, I've come to appreciate it, like I was mentioning yeah. in San Diego. I come to appreciate it once I'm not there. Yeah. So. I get that. I've come to appreciate Europe a lot since I've been here. <laughs> I'm excited to go back. I've loved America, but I'm definitely, I feel European at heart. So yeah. I'm ready to go back. <laughs> Before we, we start diving into yeah. swimming and and everything you, you've accomplished, yeah. um, you mentioned different ways of thinking, obviously because of the cultural mm-hmm. aspect, but also because of language. Mm-hmm. Like that's something I've come to understand yeah. as well. Yeah. How much have you used that, especially here? I think quite a more than I realized. I think it's just the adaptability. I think has helped a lot. I I remember calling my mom the first like month here. I had to write an essay like a one pager about myself, and I was like, I don't know how to write an English essay. I mean, I've since I did like primary school in English, I could speak English, but I'd never like written an English essay. And I called her like crying. I have to write a one page essay about myself, and now I'm like, I just wrote a thesis. So I'm like, that's like a big difference. But um, I think it just helps you like pick up on things like quickly I don't know like little differences I think I'm also pretty aware of like different cultures because even in Europe like Germany and Holland are bordering countries I said Holland see the Netherlands but um they're very different so I think I've just always been I've been fascinated I think just how different like Western European countries are and even though the languages are super similar the like, it's very different. Um, it's hard to explain. I would say, like, kind of similar to... It's, it's very, like, minute differences. But I think... I mean, one of the essays I wrote, I wrote about how, like, each country has taught me something. So, like, England has taught me, like, how to be polite and, like, follow the rules. Oh, no, Germany... England was polite, and then Germany was, like, how to follow the rules because Germans love their rules. And then Dutch was, like, to speak your mind because the Dutch just always speak their mind. So that's kind of, like, how... Who I am today is a little part of like each country I would say for sure yeah <laughs> but that's so cool like you take inspiration from yeah. everywhere and then create your own idea. exactly so I'm a European mix I would say <laughs> that's so cool European yeah. mix with a bit of America now as well yeah yeah I would say so my mom actually and my parents were here and they were joking that I definitely have a more American accent um after five years because I I would say that's also because I've been so used to like adapting to different like dialects even because when I lived in Munich Two years down the line, I had a Bavarian accent, and my dad was like, oh, no, <laughs> please don't speak like that. <laughs> but I would say definitely some American twang in there now as well. <laughs> well, even right yeah. now, like, I sense, like, a tiny bit of a British accent and then European and then a bit of Californian, yeah, it's, and it's all over the place depending on the words. Exactly, exactly. And honestly, it depends how I wake up that day. Like, if I call my mom first thing that morning, then I, like, wake up Dutch. Or if I call my dad that morning, I'm, like, German. So it's like just kind of depends on like how I wake up but I would say um a lot of people ask me like what language I dream in I have no idea I think it depends on where I am because I think if I'm in America then I dream in English but I think if I'm back in the Netherlands I dream Dutch I I don't know (laughs) do you realize how powerful that is like what you just explained really your adaptability (laughs) between languages just like that yeah it's cool it's cool it's I'm I'm grateful like it was tough moving that often like losing all my friends and it's hard to keep in contact as like a eight, nine year old, 10 year old with like friends back home. But um, it's cool. I'm it's made me who I am. And I think it's also really set me up for the future as well from things that I want to do. So, yeah, yeah. No. that's incredible. Yeah. That's incredible. Yeah, I mean, I'm sure there's sacrifices like I was thinking, well, elementary school was three different countries or something like yeah. that. And it's like, damn, like yeah. at that age, it must yeah. be really hard. Yeah. But it's I think it's paid off. Yeah, right? Because I learned how to speak English in Stockholm at the international school in Stockholm by an American teacher. And the way I learned it is they had a Dutch girl from an older year come into my class and translate everything because I could understand Dutch, but I like had never spoken English. 
And so she would like translate everything for a couple of weeks. And that's how I learned to speak English. So it's like, even that is like an American influence, Dutch influence in Sweden. That's how yeah. I learned to speak English. So it's kind of random, but no, it's <laughs> a it, cool mix. So super yeah. unique. Yeah. yeah. Because the way I've explained it, like when talking to other Europeans, I feel like the European Union is basically like the United States, but with completely different cultures. The states are the countries, basically, I would say. Exactly. That's what I always say. Like when you were mentioning like different, oh, like, um, Netherlands, I was about to say Holland, (laughs) Netherlands and Germany last week. And you just said they're bordering last week. I was in Arizona. Yeah. Completely two hour flight. Yeah. Very different. Very, very different. Later on, it's going to be like later this week, one hour flight to San Diego. Also completely different. Yeah. Yep. And don't even get me into the South, Texas, East Coast, completely like Midwest, different. Yep. completely <laughs> different. Yep. Yeah. So yep. I definitely had a bit of a culture shock coming here, but <laughs> yeah, how big America is. And I, you know, it's one country, but it's just 50 different countries, in my opinion, like each state, even like within a state like Northern and Southern California, very different. So I didn't even know that coming here, but yeah, it has opened up my eyes for sure to like what America is. Yeah. I, I'm a, I know you're global studies, but I'm a political science major. Yep. And now I think about it that same way, especially like I mentioned, since I've been getting the experience of going more to Europe recently, I understand it now as like every state is its own country in the U.S. It really is. It's so different. Yeah. Yeah. That's cool though. (laughs) Yeah. Well, let's continue with your story. You're all over the place. Yep. When does swimming come in? Yeah. Um, we, I started swimming when we moved from Sweden to London. My mom had three young kids because I have a younger brother and a younger sister. And she didn't know what to do with us. And so she put us into swimming, like camp, basically. And this was 2003. And the teacher, I, re- I actually talked about this with her this weekend because we were like reminiscing about all these different things. And she was like, yeah, the teacher basically was like, yeah, you, your daughter lies up higher in the water. You should do something with that. And my mom's like, okay. And I loved it. I went through all the like different, it was like penguin ch- otter seal shark levels or something like that and within a like a month I had done them all and I just wanted to keep swimming so went into the club there and basically every single move since I went into a swimming club um I would say I started getting good when we moved to Munich Uh because that's when I went into like a more like elite like kind of level thing um like a more like exclusionary club like where they have to invite you basically um and then I became German national age group champion in 2010 or nine one of those I can't exactly remember and that's when I was like okay I can kind of do this like I'm kind of good um and then get it started getting really serious when I moved to Amsterdam in 2011. Okay yep. so you were around 12 13 in Germany when when you started to take those steps because it was 2010 that right? was yeah n- 10 11 yeah because I'm 2009 yeah, like 10, 11, I would say, yeah, because I was 12, 13 when we moved to Amsterdam, okay. and that's when, I, that's when I started, uh, I, so when I was 13, between the summer of moving from Munich to Amsterdam, I had qualified for my first, like, international, it was the European Youth Olympic Festival in Turkey, <laughs> it was kind of cool, it was really cool, it was like a mini, like, they tried to emulate the Olympic Games at, like, a really small level for, like, youth, it was really cool, we had, like, stayed in a village and everything, and then, um, as of then, I got invited to swim with the national team of like the youth team. So when we moved to Amsterdam, I started training with the like youth regional training center group. So that's how I came into the Dutch Swimming Federation. How how did you decide to swim under the Dutch identity? Was it because you got that invitation or did something else come into consideration? So we, when we lived in Munich, uh, I knew we were going to move to Amsterdam and my mom had reached out to the, like just literally looked up on Google, like, swimming federation holland and then like emailed some person and they were like yeah by the way if she swims this time there's this me um and that's when my parents and i like sat down and talked about whether i would want to actually really represent the netherlands because once you decide i think it's like if you then want to switch to another country you have to have two years where you don't represent a country so kind of making that decision was like for good kind of um and then I, I flew by myself to Amsterdam, qualified for the European Youth Olympic Festival, and then I kind of went from there. So, That's awesome. Yeah. Is that the nationality you feel most attached to? Ooh, I don't know if my dad would like this, but I would say so. I think also just because, you know, representing the Netherlands, like having the Dutch cap on your flag, like the Dutch flag on your cap and swimming for them. And I have been there the longest. I've never lived in Austria, but I definitely have family there, and I do feel Austrian, like, at heart. Um, but I would say that's the nationality I most, like, 
I would say I'm low seat Dutch. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry, Dad. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm the same with my parents. I'm, I feel way more American than Mexican. Okay. I mean, they're yeah. not American, yeah. so yeah. I can relate. I think it just has a lot to do with where you've lived the longest, and that's the Netherlands right now. So, and I'm moving back there now as well. So, yeah. That's yeah. where my, my family lives, my friends are. So, yeah, that makes the most sense. So. Yeah. So, besides, your, like, all the cities you've lived in, the traveling is pretty amazing as well, right? Yeah. You were in Turkey. I saw that you competed in China, in Israel. And then once you got into, like, the senior national yeah. team, well, I mean, that, that opens all the doors. Yeah. And then you come here and you're continuing to compete everywhere. So, how was that experience now that you have already experienced so many cultures? Was there a level of maturity that you saw that you had in comparison to others that didn't? I think so, a little bit. I think it's just like opening up your eyes to like the whole world. I think I counted, I've been to like 48 countries, which is insane at 24 years old. Um, and a lot of those are where I only see the swimming pool and the hotel, but it is cool. Like you drive by and you're in that country. Um, I went on my first training camp when I was nine years old to Cyprus and my mom actually decided that she thought it was so scary that she booked the hotel next to us and just stayed there in case it went wrong or I wanted to go home. Um, but yeah, nine years old being in Cyprus for two weeks away from your parents is a pretty young thing to do. <laughs> um, but I would say it's just a level of, like opening up your mind and like your opinions and your curiosities and seeing a lot of like of the world I think I think it's super important but it's also obviously something that not many people get to do and I'm like grateful that I've had that um and definitely don't take it for granted yeah yeah um, it's definitely like important to put it into perspective yeah, I yeah. think like 48 yeah. countries yeah it's not normal I know that <laughs> yeah. yeah and I that's like I want to do something good with that like that's why I want to go into the diplomacy world like into the foreign service but because I've had that opportunity and I want to do something with it but it is you know, I talk to people here and they have no idea where the Netherlands is. And I'm like, wow, okay, maybe in my opinion first, I was like, oh, you're like, don't you know anything about the world? But America's huge. Like, that's what I've come to learn. But it is like, I think also a lot of Americans don't know about European countries, but which I think has always been interesting, like opening up your eyes to that. But um, yeah, it's, I would say it's definitely something I, it's very special, like having traveled to so many different countries, yeah. It puts things into a completely different perspective, like oh. you're saying, but yeah, I mean, I'll, I can criticize it myself. Yeah. I grew up here, I was raised here, everything like school-wise, so you're, when we learn about history, it's through an American yeah. lens, right? So yeah. American history, there's a reason we say we're the best country in the yeah. world, because we don't know any other country. Yeah. Only 30% of Americans have a passport. Yeah, I actually learned that recently. It's crazy. But then again, I do somewhat understand it because you have like every single climate in America. So if you want to go on vacation, you can go anywhere in America. You don't necessarily have to leave. But it does. It's a bubble in that sense. Like we were talking about bubbles. But um, yeah, <laughs> it's when I learned that as well, I was like, OK, well, I'm like spoiled in that sense because Europe, you drive two hours and you're in Germany, like for me. So it's like super normal, like crossing a state is crossing a country, as we were saying before. Yeah. Yeah. So. And, and it's crazy to put things into that perspective. Like you have two nationalities or I mean, I can relate yeah. to that part. Yeah. I have two nationalities yeah. as well. And it's like, wow, I have two passports yeah. and most like that's 70% not, of yeah. the country doesn't, doesn't even, even have, have one. one. Yeah. I know that's crazy. Yeah. 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 It, it's ridiculous to, to think that way, but I'm glad you're using that like to your advantage as you should yeah. I think like it it'd be a shame to have all of that and not be using it yeah my dad always made sure that we knew how like unique our childhood was and to not be just like take it for granted he definitely always made sure that we knew that that was a pretty unique thing to have traveled to so many countries at a young age and it helps you know he works in the hotel industry so we could always just like go to different hotels across the world which is also not normal and I'm like so mm -hmm. grateful that we got to do all those things but yeah, he always made sure that we knew that that was that we were grateful for that and like appreciated it for what it was. Yeah. So you have that personal experience with all of that yeah. traveling <laughs> and uh, like moving and things like that. But within swimming, you also have experiences of getting to know other cultures in a different way, in a competitive sense. Take me through what it was like competing. I know like you competed in the European short course, long course, like even before coming here, obviously the Olympics as well. Like there's so many different cultural aspects. What's the difference between going to school and then competing against 
different cultures as well. Yeah. Um, I think it's super cool when, so I've, yeah, I've done European short course, long course, worlds, short course, long course, and Olympics. And you're like, there's always like a ready room or like where we put our bags down and start doing dry land. And you're looking around and you see every, almost like every single country. And it's so interesting to see how each country goes about things in a different way. Like I remember England started doing this thing with like an active dry land. And then, but we always like, all within the swimming world, at least like we kind of like pick from each other. Like coaches are constantly looking at each other and seeing what their like athletes are doing. And I think in that way we are all like learning from each other. Um, but I do remember there's some countries I've like people from certain countries I've never spoken to. And then there's like people that you know and talk to all the time. I would say definitely within Europe because it's a smaller like grouping and um, you've done European short course. So, you know, like those people and you like you see them at the European Youth Olympic Festival in 2011 and then at the Olympics in 2016, which is really cool. Um, but I don't know. I don't think I have learned that much about like cultures. Definitely at swimming. But I do see like. America always to me was like an untouchable country and they were always like so serious and they're in their own bubble and super loud and they had like bells and like with like I always thought it was super cool and how like much of a team they encapsulate like I think America very much has that like team aspect whereas like Holland I would say they take it much more in a Netherlands <laughs> see I do it all the time <laughs> it's just easier Holland flows off my mouth like a lot better but the Netherlands thank you we, I would say they take swimming as a much more like individual thing. We just have a group of individuals coming together, whereas America is very like, we're here as a team and you're representing the USA. I don't know, as it, there's not as much of that within the Netherlands, so, yeah. yeah. And do you still, like, still see it that way now that you've... I do, I see it even more that way, yeah. Wow. Yeah. Okay, yeah. interesting. So there, countries take it in a different sense, but I would say swimming is pretty generic, but I, th I think each country just has their, like, specific ways of going about things yeah yeah um, interesting i think that the best part is that you mentioned that you were learning from every person yeah. to get into the question you asked me before we started yeah. recording that's kind of why i started with okay. the podcast right okay. so um basically the story is freshman year spring semester pandemic hits yep and I'm used oh, that to was your freshman year. my freshman year oh my god that's so sad exactly <laughs> exactly so i came into season very hard season because we're fall, so we yeah. start right away. Yeah. Hard season personally. Um, and then I come back and I was, this is a fun story actually, I was sick from February oh. to March. <laughs> Extremely sick. Like, and, and I got tested for everything and they were like, it's not we the flu. No. They kept telling me, it's not the flu. And I'm like, I've never felt worse okay. in my life. Like, it, it was bad. I didn't go to school or practice for three weeks. Whoa. Like, it was that okay. bad. Um, very, very bad. And then once I was fine again, I come back and the next week we sent, were sent back home. home. So that, that's like my freshman year experience. I didn't have anything. Um, I think it was, yeah, it was yesterday actually that I got my two year notification on Google photos, but basically I was very bored at home, yeah. like most of the Everyone. world. Yep. <laughs> and something I got into was reading the news. That was my goal for mm -hmm. 2020. Like New Year's resol resolution was just reading the news a bit more. That's a great one. So I, I got into that a lot, and I was reading all these things, and I got really pissed off, not at the world, but at my friends, or not pissed off, annoyed, at how misinformation was mm. guiding them during the pandemic. Yeah. So what I did was, oh, I'm already reading all these news sources. I'm sending them the links, and they're like, dude, I'm not going to read all these links. <laughs> Stop so, sending me all these links. <laughs> exactly. So I was like, what can I do? So I took all these links from different sources I summarized it and I would make a video every single night to explain to them Whoa, what was going on in the world. Cool. Yeah. I like that. <laughs> so that's a cool idea. Yeah. So that's how I got yeah. into it. And then one of my dad's best friend's daughter caught on to that. She's a few years older than me. So we hadn't met. She saw that and she was like, Oh, I'm into content creation. Let's start making videos. So she was recording. I was writing and speaking into the camera. That's cool. Yesterday marked two years since I put no the way. phone in front of me for the first time <laughs> and started talking into That's it. That's awesome. And through conversations, things like that, it was all in Spanish. Okay. But I was like, damn, if I come back to Cal, I'm not going to be doing this anymore. How can I keep it going? One, how can I keep it going? Yeah. Two, I want to get to know people, yeah. but I don't enjoy going out. Okay. What can I do? Yeah. Perfect. Yep. Perfect solution. <laughs> but but the point is that in the same way that, that you're taking little things or that the coaches are taking little things from every mm -hmm. team or things like that, I'm kind of doing the same thing. That's like cool. at the end, I have 
like a list of lessons that I learned from every person. And then I put those That's together really and it's impacted me yeah. a lot. I was, um, I was talking with, who was it? I was talking with Eloise uh, earlier this week. Yeah, awesome. And we were just talking like leadership things mm-hmm. and within teams and things like that. And she asked me like what we're doing within our team. Yeah. And I explained and I told her like it actually came from talking to some of your teammates on the podcast as well that I got that same idea, yeah. combined it with other teams' yeah. ideas. And now we're doing this. So yeah. you're like picking. That's good, though. Yeah. I mean, Cal is a great place to pick and choose from. So, I mean, you've got the like best athletes the at the best university. And it's a good place to learn from, I would say. I think we don't yeah. take enough advantage of that. Like, I, uh, I think two days ago now, Nina Shank was here and we were talking about the same thing. Like, there's so many amazing student athletes at Cal. Like, everyone has their own story. Yeah. And I don't pretend to be able to find out what everybody's story is but if I can get to know 50 stories that's still a lot lot. and that's what I'm trying to do because let's take this out of context or or the setting like we would never be having this specific conversation (laughs) if there weren't cameras lights and mics in front of us you know that's true yep like yep I don't know I didn't want to interrupt no 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 I think I mean especially this year because I'm a so I'm a fifth year um so I think especially this year, my dad was like, okay, do this fifth year, but make sure you like use it properly and like do things you wouldn't normally do. And I started like using the resources or like actually talking to other, like so many more people. And I was like, oh my, what is that? What have I been doing for the past four years? Like you start, it starts opening up your eyes. And I mean, this is like a bubble again, but it is an incredible bubble. So I feel like it's the best place to try and learn from other people and incredible stories. Like, I feel like that's such a cool thing about Berkeley. Like you meet anyone they have a story and that's I mean you can never get to know all of them but that you're starting so that's cool <laughs> yeah it's yeah. it's better to get to know some than yeah. none at yeah. all because I I know there's 930 stories yeah. here I don't think I'll even get to know 100 yeah. but 50 is better yeah. than zero yeah. sort Agreed. of thing yeah. um and that's exactly why as you asked me earlier as well I'm a junior rising senior mm-hmm. and I'm like nope I cannot leave here right now I like, want to be gone <laughs> yeah I have to stay a bit longer yeah, so that's fair that's well, part I didn't, of it yeah. it was worth it <laughs> yeah. yeah so as you start competing more and more take me through that experience of European short course European long course like as you, especially leading up to the Olympics mm-hmm. was that a goal you had was it like something you thought about as a kid or did it just come um no it's I've definitely always wanted to go that was the dream I remember I was in vacation in Italy in 2008 and we was the Olympic Beijing games and the Dutch uh females won the four by 100 freestyle relay and I remember sitting in the pool watching it and I was like I want to do that that's that's who I want to be and um at that point that's when I was like okay I want to do this seriously I remember like even telling my parents I was like I want to do that (laughs) um and then I would say I once I got into the Dutch Swimming Federation, like a lot of doors opened up because it's just they take swimming pretty seriously because we're a tiny country of 17 million people, but they take swimming very seriously. It's not a big like fan sport. Like it's not like we have a lot of per- people watching us, but they w- people know that we're a good swimming country. Um, so once I got into that, I was like, OK, I'm pretty I'm set. And if I do well, then I'm good. Um, and I kind of got good like all of a sudden, like, I didn't think, I never thought Rio would be possible. It was kind of always, like, 2020 was, like, I think age-wise, like, the goal more. Um, But I I had an operation on my nose, like, on my sinus in 2015. Took, like, three months off, and then my coach was like, okay, if we want to make the Olympics, how are we going to do this? And at this time, I was swimming backstroke still. He was like, there's a spot in the 4x200 freestyle every day, and I think you're pretty good at freestyle. How about we just switch it? And I was like, what? Why would you do that? (laughs) Because I had been swimming backstroke, like, all along. But I trusted him. I loved my coach. I was like, okay, you know what? I'm just going to... I'm going to trust you all this way. And then all of a sudden, I made European short course. Within, like, three months, I'd gone, like, seconds off of my PB. And then that December, I almost got the qualification time. And then I was really, like, on the potential Olympic list as of January 2016. And, like, started going on training camps. And, like, really started going with the senior national team, which I hadn't until then. And then in April, we had our qualification, and I I think I saw him, like, a two-and-a-half-second PB, which is just, like, not normal in swimming. I, I don't know That's what insane. happened. It's unreal. Yeah, it's crazy. And then all of a sudden, I was second, and you can only have two people per country, per event, and I 
the girl who was third was 0.02 slower than me. Wow. <laughs> I, so I, I don't know. I must have had like the perfect finish and that's how I got to swim. So I qualified with the 4x200, but because I was second, I also got to swim the 200 freestyle individually. So it was an unreal year because I was, I just turned 18. Um, I, I was all of a sudden with like my idols, like the, my roommate at the Olympics or she wasn't my roommate at the Olympics, but at Europeans that year was one of the girls who won the relay in 2008. And I remember being at the European championships in May in London and we had won a medal at this championship with her. And I'm just like, I remember like idolizing you and now you're like my roommate. I was like, this is insane. That's crazy. <laughs> yeah, so, Idols become roommates. Yeah, Femme Games Gerk. I've always looked up to her, so she's she's cool. <laughs> That's amazing. Yeah. That's incredible. Yeah. With with the thing you mentioned about freestyle, I could have sworn like from from what the information that yeah. is available, it's all freestyle. Yeah, because I got I started getting good when it was freestyle. Like that's when I like started qualifying for senior international meets. But like the youth Olympic games in twenty fourteen I was a backstroke and then the Olympic Games two years later was freestyle so yeah <laughs> I mean a lot of freestylers do backstroke and it's not like it's more like freestyle backstroke and breaststroke and free, uh, fly are more kind of the groupings you tend to see so it wasn't like that big of a switch but you know we switched in August the Olympic year I don't like I don't know you always feel like it's a four-year period towards the Olympics but I had nothing to lose no one knew who I was I like I was not on the potential list of anything so I was like you know what why not so yeah no. did, did that like huge change in terms of how quickly your level just went yeah. up was that a surprise to you yeah yeah I, I mean it like it was all of a sudden because I I mean in August of 2015 I was still kind of a nobody and that's when I like went to the because I'd gone to the senior training center the year before because I was starting to get good but the backstroke just wasn't really taking me anywhere so that's where it was like okay let's do a switch I guess um and then all of a sudden I'm going to Thailand and Tenerife and Malaga on like training camp and I'm like, what? Whoa. <laughs> so, and at the same time I was trying to finish high school this year. So it was, it was a lot. I was doing my final exams and I, Europeans was right at the same time as my final exam period. So that, that was a lot, but I feel like that prepared me for Cal. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Yep. <laughs> so yep. well, a few things to break up there. Yep. Um, such a quick change yep. in your career. You mentioned, like, nobody knowing who you were mm -hmm. and you had nothing to lose. Mm -hmm. Take me through that underdog mentality. Was it, uh, like, it definitely takes pressure off, but yes. how much did it help you? I think it, it helped me a lot because I was, like, I, I had so much fun at this point. And I think that's one thing I've definitely learned over the years. I swim the best when I'm having the most fun. And, like, I was swimming with, I was 18. I was swimming with, like, 26, 27, 28-year-olds. And I was, like, the little baby girl on the team I was like this is so cool I'm with like the big guys <laughs> training with them and doing in like I was swimming all the time I was swimming like 20, 20 plus hours a week like I was like 35 hours at least like a week at this point like wow. running as well like it was unreal it was that was everything it was like swimming was at that year at, for sure was absolutely everything and I in December it was like our first qualification meet and I was not I was good enough to like be taken along with things and I was just like whoa and then January we went on a three-week training camp to Thailand and that's when I started getting like really into the group and I was just like this is so cool <laughs> I was very I was super jittery and like the little girl who knew nothing but um it was fun yeah it was so much fun yeah that's so interesting and did you ever have like were you having fun and taking the pressure off or did you also have a sense of like the hungry underdog that's yeah. like has that competitive edge I would say well. from like August to December like it was super underdog it's to see what happens but then when I knew I was slowly like I had a shot as of January I was like okay I like this is kind of it like I need to do this and I was getting super hungry for that yeah so I was like it was like reachable it was like right there and I was like this is what I want like I should go for it all the way um and I I remember talking with my coach in January in Thailand, I was like, I actually think I could kind of make this. And I was like, did I just say that out loud? Yeah, I did. <laughs> but um, that's when I realized it was possible. Um, and yeah, four months later, I qualified. So that was pretty sick. <laughs> but before we talk about that qualification, yeah. um, to go back on, to your point of like getting to know different stories and yeah. taking the best from everyone, Yesterday, Noah Newfield from uh, Men's Gymnastics, he's a sophomore, mm -hmm. he was here, mm -hmm. and he's going through that stage right now. Oh, so the best stage ever. Yeah, so, so <laughs> I want to go back. <laughs> he came in as a senior in high school that was, according to him, 
a medium recruit. Like, okay. he was not one of the bigger names in the sport. And right now, he's, like, on the brink of making the national wow. team. That's awesome. So he's, like, right there. And yeah. he's, like, but me being the underdog is what's driving me right yeah. now. Yeah. And you saying that is oh, so it interesting. Definitely, it definitely. I was, like, I, I, like, I want to prove people wrong. Because I really did. Because it wasn't like people were not rooting for me. I think everyone's, like, whoa, okay, like, this Robin girl is like, who is she? Like, we're kind of, I'm kind of coming up. But I was like, okay, I got to prove to them that I can do this. Because I don't think anyone really else thought in January that I was like actually going to make it because I was nowhere before. So it was like kind of like unheard of. Whereas all these older like professional athletes had been training for this for like cycles and years. And I was like, how cool would this be if I actually like could do this? Um, And my parents were always like, stay humble like it's okay if it doesn't work out like they've always been like the best supporters but I was like no I'm doing this <laughs> I was like I need to I, I'm just gonna prove that I can do this yeah so that definitely was the driving force of that yeah he definitely said the same thing of like I have something to prove he yeah. was rookie of the year and then in the post interview he said no I still have something to prove That's which awesome. is yeah he, it <laughs> it's was never enough <laughs> never it's never ending That's definitely like an athlete mentality yeah <laughs> did you have your ego start to boost up at that time or not really no because um Femke Heemskerk I remember at European when at European short course she like for the first time said my name and I was like whoa Femke knows my name <laughs> and I rem- I kind of same like I wanted to learn from her because I was like you are so cool and she told me she was like one of the coolest things is staying humble as an athlete when you like are rising she was like I have always made sure that I am so grateful for everything that comes and I'm like humble in the experience and I was like okay I think you're super cool so that's what I'm going to try and do and I think that's definitely been something I've tried to like take with me as well as like no matter how successful or what's happened or whatever opportunity comes at me I like want to stay humble in it because I've seen athletes who don't do that and I'm like "Mm, it's not I don't know I don't think it's like the way to go personally um so I remember her saying that to me I was like okay yep that's that's who I want to be. <laughs> that's so yeah. awesome. Uh, in in Stoic literature, there's someone that's always brought up, uh, Cato the Younger, and yeah. Cato the Younger was always mentioned, but there's nothing that he wrote specifically. Mm-hmm. He was just mentioned as the character that people looked up to mm-hmm. in terms of being a role model, yeah. and that's like what exactly. modern Stoicism is saying. It's like you have to have someone in your mind that you look up to, and you don't have to interact with them at all, but just have them in your mind, and it's like. What would they be doing? Yeah. How can I be learning yeah. from them? And I feel like it's the yeah. exact same thing yeah. you're saying. Yeah, so I, I definitely, you know, and then a couple of months later, I was her roommate and I was like, oh, this is so cool. <laughs> but I remember her saying that. I was like, yep, okay. All right, stay humble it is. <laughs> yeah, yep. that's yeah. important. Yeah, yeah. and in, when, when you did qualify, when was that? I think it was in, in Europeans, right? Um, no, so it was April 2016. Um, it was our like Olympic qualification meet. Officially, I had qualified after Europeans in May because that's when the time like the time to qualify like finished um, or ended. But I made it in um, April of 2016. Yeah. So you go from in 2015 being a backstroker to in 2016 qualifying for <laughs> for freestyle. Yeah. You remain humble. You're still learning. You're very hungry. Mm-hmm. What was the? You know what? quick break again because you have so many things going on (laughs) like you mentioned academically Mm -hmm. which we're gonna definitely get into later how serious were you about academics back then I know right now you had an amazing resume at Cal (laughs) um but at that time balancing all of that how Mm -hmm. were your academics and how much did you prioritize it growing up as a student um I've always prioritized it and that's definitely because of my parents because they were always like you can swim but you have to take academics just as seriously. So they were always like, we're going to be on your side for swimming and you can do it. But my dad always reminded me that swimming is going to end at some point And then there's, you have a much longer life after that. He oh like, that's like pounded in me. <laughs> so I always took academics pretty seriously. And growing up, I did my elementary school in England. And it's a pretty like rigorous academic environment. As I remember doing like as an 11 year old doing 11 plus exams, trying to get into high school, like basically like final exams at 11 years old but that really taught me to take academics seriously um so I've always taken academics seriously but when I went to uh the Netherlands I got to because of my top sports status got to go to like a sports school where I could basically do what I wanted as long as I passed um and they gave me a lot of like freedom in what I was doing so I 
um, it's like the center of top sport and education or something like that. So I actually split my exam year of high school into two years because in the Netherlands you have to graduate in or yeah eight subjects and I did four one year in 2016 and four the next year in 2017. Okay. So that gave me a lot more time because we realized that Europeans were right in the exam period. I, I went, I did my German exam and then flew later to London to meet the team. Three days later, swam and then flew back early to do my economics exam. I can't remember which one it was, but that was a very <laughs> stressful period. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. And I'm sure their your teammates at that point are laughing because they have nothing to do with that. Oh academics no, they, they had like either. I mean, they are all professional athletes, and they're like, what? Like high school exams? But it was funny, and my coach definitely always helped me. And he, um, so my coach Martin Trarens at this point, he definitely helped me like take it seriously and he was like okay I want you to finish your high school exam like or, like that's important so he's like how can we combine these two things so that was he definitely helped me in that but I it was never like I'm not gonna do it like that just never was an option it was always take academics just as seriously as swimming yeah so you're taking academics extremely seriously your whole life swimming as you're mentioning it you're like you bring it up and yeah. you're like writing it up right now you're like super <laughs> excited about it yeah. What about anything else in life? Did Was there a balance with social life or was swimming and academics your entire life at that, that point? That year, that 2015-16, I was a hermit. <laughs> I think it was just school and just swimming. I remember my coach, the same coach I just mentioned, he was like, when you're planning out your week, like actually maybe like plan an hour for yourself because I was so, he was the one who told me how to like plan my week out and I've done it ever since like that. But he was like in a day, like actually from 8 to 9 p.m., you're not studying, you're not swimming, just like, and you're not sleeping, but just do something. Because he always said, like, doing things outside of these, like, swimming and school was important. But I didn't know really what that meant. I think Cal definitely told me that a lot, just like to take, we'll get to it, but like, do things for yourself as well that are fun. But at that point, I would say 2015, 16, it was just focus mode for sure. <laughs> Before 15, 16, were you also focus mode? I would say less. I mean, always academics but I think just more socially because swimming wasn't I didn't know if it was like really taking me anywhere so I, I was definitely serious but I've always been a pretty serious person <laughs> especially in the pool um but a little bit more but yeah 2015-16 when I realized I actually had a shot I was like okay but like I'm going I'm going focus mode <laughs> and in 15-16 what were you doing from 8 to 9 p.m like what were some of the things you probably doing? just watch Netflix <laughs> Just chill on the couch with my dog <laughs> and watch Netflix or just like, yeah, yeah. And, and through that planning of the week that you mentioned that you still do to this day, what does that look like? And when do you do it? Is it like on Sunday you plan the rest of the week or, or what do you it's do? It's been like, a, I would say like learn from my mistakes. I would say I used to, I remember coming at Cal, like read every single word. I think every freshman is petrified and now I'm like, nah, <laughs> we're fine if I just skim through. But I think I've definitely learned to prioritize like friendships and social life because that has like, it helps me realize I'm more than just like a swimmer or just like academics or whatever. So I would say this year is a bit different just because I really prioritize that above anything else. Cause I, okay, this is my last year in America. Like I need to make the best out of it and I'm never going to like, I'm not going to see these people for so long or I'm never going to live in America. I think, I don't know what happens later on in life, but um, I would say the past, like for the four, the first four years, I think it was super cool coming here because I saw like Kathleen Baker and like all these Abby Whitesell and they were like having fun outside of the pool. And I was like, OK, if they're doing it, then I could do it. <laughs> and that told me like, OK, there's academics and there's swimming, but having a social life and doing fun things is equally as important. Wow. No. Yeah, that's powerful. And before, again, we get into <laughs> the Olympics, when does Cal recruiting come that into year. it? After or before Olympics? After the Olympics. Okay, so let, let's get into Well, I the... started, I think it was a little before. I think I first started talking to my coach in 2016 about it um, because I knew that it just had to be something like done pretty early on. Um, but once I qualified for the Olympics in April, that's when I started getting emails and started getting recruited. And that's when I started thinking about it. So you got the emails, you weren't sending them? No, I okay. got them, yeah. Okay. I mean, it was... I was all of a sudden swam like a really good time and that's how my name got out there and I think USC was the first school to email me and I was like that's pretty cool because <laughs> I know like Katinka Hasu like a really famous swimmer like she used to go there and a lot of other names and I knew the coach um it's like okay 
And then I emailed them back and then I think word somehow spread and I got a lot of emails. But I actually do think that I'm the one who emailed Cal. I don't, don't quote me on that, but I, I remember starting to do research. I was like, okay, if this is actually something that I want to do, I need to look at like, what are the best schools academic wise? What are the best schools like swimming wise? And like cross, cross reference those. And Cal definitely came out on top from that because Missy Franklin and Nadia Kovlin, I was like, I want to go there. That's, that's where I should go. Um, and I think I was like, you know, I'm just going to, I'm just going to email, see what happens. So, yeah. That's awesome. And uh, from an international perspective, you, did you always think about studying in the U S no, no, it was, it was then when I got my first email, cause I think I realized that getting my bachelor's degree in the Netherlands was always going to be tough while swimming at such a high level, because it's just not, you don't swim for the university. The professors do not care that you're doing there's like it's your own fault that you can't make this exam um and i remember that you're starting to like look at options and like what i wanted to do and i was like and eh, the netherlands like this isn't great this isn't exactly like i could do maybe like spend seven years doing my bachelor's degree but that just wasn't what i wanted to do and then i got the email and i was like perfect like okay i want to go to america so yeah and how did you decide cal when you had Probably a good amount of options. Yeah, so after the Olympics, I flew to America by myself, which was petrifying, and visited five schools back to back. And I think it was like USC, Arizona, Cal, Georgia, Stanford, stuff like that. And um, I, I think I was at Cal the least amount of time. I was here for like less than 24 hours. And I just like picked with the team. I love the idea of being like close to such an international city of San Francisco. I love the idea of swimming outside. <laughs> um, and then I was like, okay, this is just where I have to be. Yeah. That's so awesome. Yeah. That's yeah. so awesome. Well, we can't jump over the Olympics. Yes. <laughs> so what was that experience like for you? It's in Rio that year. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's a normal Olympics, especially because yes. <laughs> I've talked to many people no. that went to no. Tokyo. Um, and that's definitely special and unique. But in, in Rio, what was that experience like at that age, mm-hmm. especially uh, with those teammates take me through that. I know you were in the 200 free and the 800 free relay, mm-hmm. right? Yep. Okay. So those are the two events that I swam. Um, when I actually think about the Olympics, I don't, I didn't have the best experience. Um, I mean, it was incredible that I was there. I was 18 years old. I, I was just like the wide eyed, like puppy tail. I was like, what is going on? <laughs> um, I remember going to the dining hall and looking to my right and all of a sudden Usain Bolt was standing next to me. And I just like, what am I doing here? I do not belong here. I mean, walking around like the Olympic village and seeing like Federer and like Nadal and all these like the most diverse amount of people like you've ever seen, like the tallest, the shortest, like the, like the best of the best. I was like, this is so sick. Um, but the Dutch team itself didn't do very well. It was the first time we didn't win a medal since 1992 in the pool. And because of that, there was just like bad vibes in the team, bad vibes like from the coaching staff. And um, we actually got like sent home early because I mean, now with COVID, that's kind of normal that once you're done, like you get sent home. But back then in 2016, it wasn't like you were supposed to stay there the whole time until the closing ceremony, look at other sports. And they dubbed it, the the media dubbed it the loser's flight, which was kind of sad because <laughs> anyone without a medal was sent home because they were like, you're distracting. Like, we just need to send you home, even though like we were just in our rooms. Um, but yeah, I look back at it and there's some, like, just not the best memories. I didn't swim well either, which honestly I'm not surprised about because I was just so in awe of everything that was going on. And so like my coach definitely like talked to me about it and prepared me and told me like how these things like work. And I'd been to two international meets at this point, Europeans. So it wasn't world championships either. So the Olympics was just like next level. Um, but I was definitely... It was a lot as an 18 year old. Yeah. And I was like in the heat with the, like Frederita Pellegrini. She has the world record right now. So on the 200 free and I was like, what am I? I just had like, what am I doing here? Like, <laughs> whoa. <laughs> um, but I mean, it was an incredible experience and I'm like super proud that I went. Um, but I definitely left feeling unsatisfied and like wanting to go again um, because I wanted to have a better experience. So that's when I afterwards I was like, okay, well, 2020 it is now. So that's like, yeah, immediately I was like, okay, new cycle. I want to go again because I just wanted to swim better at the Olympics the next time. That was the goal. So, yeah. And yeah. and when, I mean, obviously the past Olympics were right now and the people I have talked to that just went, they all have different mentalities. Mm-hmm. Some are reacting the same way you did yeah. in the sense of 
done next yep. like new cycle let's get straight mm-hmm. into it others were like you know what i'm gonna take oh, yeah, a break I, <laughs> I know uh post olympic is a big mental thing did you experience that at all i think it helps that i had a new like goal in mind with america because right after i went on this america trip for a month and like traveled around so i was super excited about being recruited and then making the decision to come to cal so i knew that year that this was my last year in holland and that I had a whole new chapter ahead. So I think that really helped. But I definitely have experienced like the blues. I think this year, like I just stopped swimming officially. Um, so, which is still crazy, like sounds weird to say, but <laughs> um, I definitely get that. Yeah, I've, I understand it, but I, I didn't have it then. Cause I, I was young, I was still really eager and I was like, okay, this is like just the beginning and I want to keep going. So yeah. yeah, that's awesome. And I mean, right away because you came to cal 20, 2017 all right and in 2017 you did go to worlds in budapest yep so you were still on the, the rise. world's Uda- budapest was 2019 i think world or world long course yeah I think that, that, so. was, that was 19 yep i oh. think it was the year before before pandemic i went to european long course the summer in 2018 huh some some bio got it wrong definitely <laughs> well um, that's what i in my memory i came in 2017 in august and then qualified for the european championships the following year okay. so i had european championships in glasgow in scotland the year after nothing in budapest the, that was the year after budapest wow. yep 2019 well regardless of what year it was or yep. wasn't at this <laughs> point <matter. laughs> you come to cal the, yep. the year after new goals new aspirations um you don't really hit those blues at least like you mentioned yeah. yet and you do come back to like representing mm-hmm. like the netherlands yes, there we go. <laughs> <laughs> i was about to say it, and yeah, i'm like yeah, nope I'm the netherlands <laughs> yeah so so you, you do go back in that and you're doing well in, in the 200 free and the 800 free relay again you know right? what i just realized budapest was 2017 it was before i came to cal you were wrong i was wrong you're right budapest was the summer before i came to cal you're right. I was about to say to everyone watching, <laughs> right, I right, do my research right. right. <laughs> I take Budapest pride. It was just 2017, and I actually did do very well that year. I made semifinals individually, so that was like the first time that I like made a final, like my or semifinals. But I was like, that was so cool. I was 16th in the world. I was like, this is awesome. So that year, I actually did pretty well. I was coming off of a high. I would say it's definitely a card because at that point, people like started knowing my name. But I, I think I was so excited about that and like that I had just. Reali- that I was realizing what I'd accomplished that year before and I had America coming up and I was like, okay, I'm, life is great. So you were right. It was the year before I came I to take Cal. a lot of pride yeah. in my research and I was I looking was at wrong. it. I was wrong. I was wrong. I was looking Sorry. at it and I was like, oh, nope. No. But, 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 I mean, I can't be the one to tell you like, no, that's not what no, you did. No, you're right. Budapest is 2017. Okay. Yep. Yeah. yeah, World Championships. Yep, of okay. course. So. I, was, I, I was about to say, either the bio <laughs> had it wrong or something. It's I been a lot of years. I, I, I mix them yeah. up. So yeah. I mean, I, I can't tell you directly. Like, <laughs> I mean, I'm. this is the first time we're meeting. Yep. And I can't tell you, like, no, that's Your not what you did. Your experience is wrong, bro. Yeah. No, I can't. But um, anyways, so 2017, that's before. Yes, before I came to come. And that's your first experience, finals. At- yep. Yep. That was so cool. That was sick. I remember um, I was in the last heat of the 200 freestyle that morning, and then immediately on the big scoreboard they show the top 16, and I I qualified into the final or into the semifinals as 16th, and there was photos of me being like, like I couldn't. I was like, are you kidding? I remember looking at my coach. I was like, I did it. <laughs> so um, I'm. That was a really cool experience. And Hungary is a huge swimming country. They love their swimming. So it was, the like crap like the most crowded pool I've ever seen and like they started like playing around with lights set pools and like turning off the lights and shows and my name came across the board with like I was like this okay this is so sick that's awesome. so that was awesome yeah that was a cool experience that's a great way to come into your Cal experience yes. as well <laughs> yep so you come into Cal you've never lived in the U.S. at nope. this point was the first time you came to visit or had you been here before I've been in America and like way as a baby because we have some friends because my dad lived in New York for a while so we have some family friends um but the after the Olympics in 2016 was like the first time I really like traveled around America so I would say I've been to America a few times but really only seen it once for a couple weeks so not much experience (laughs) was there any I mean you've you can adapt that is a fact but was there a culture shock at all Yes, I would say so. I think it helps that I moved to California. I think it would have been a very different experience had I moved to Texas or Georgia or something like that. Um, 
it's hard to pinpoint what the culture shock is. I would say everything was bigger. Just Europe is a very small country. Like Holland is a small, I said it again. The Netherlands is a small country. I need to change that in my head. Wow. The Netherlands is a small country. Amsterdam is tiny and you bike everywhere. And now all of a sudden you have to like drive everywhere. And there's so many people. And I mean, Berkeley itself, I would say is a culture shock for anyone who comes here if you're not used to it. Um, but Amsterdam and Berkeley are pretty similar because Amsterdam is also very open-minded, free speech, like all that. So that helped, I would say. But just, you know, coming, moving across the world, shock, I would say. <laughs> yeah, because, I mean, I was telling you, I've never been to Amsterdam, but yeah. I do know that it has a reputation of free speech yeah. and it, how progressive it is. we're the first country who, leg- who legalized gay marriage and uh, soft drugs and stuff like that. So we are a pretty progressive country, yeah. yeah. Yeah, so there's that, but at the same time, it's college, it's the U.S., so, yeah. so there's definitely something different um i i just posted something like before this because it's this was my first relatively normal spring semester yeah like relatively because even at the beginning of the semester we were online yep. so i posted with that caption and one of my roommates just comments like nothing is normal in berkeley and <laughs> it's like yep that is that's a, so true yeah. <laughs> yeah but luckily i had a normal freshman and sophomore year yeah. so that was that was cool yeah take me through that experience your, your freshman oh my year. gosh I was so homesick I I was way more homesick than I thought I would be I called my mom every single day the first semester was rough I think also coming into a team swimming had always been a super individual thing for me my I was swimming with eight people before this and all of a sudden you're in a team of 25 girls um with a pretty you know huge culture of excellence and a lot of requirements and norms and values and histories and traditions and I was I was overwhelmed um I think as any freshman is and living in the dorms and doing I'm not sure I understand I'm okay watch thank you (laughs) um (laughs) we were just talking about apple watches they're they're great but they are funky us this was Siri no I know that was Siri but who was talking about apple watches you or weren't we talking about that with the notifications oh beforehand yes beforehand Yes. yes F- so, f- fun yeah. fact, the only people that has happened to here were both women swimmers. Like, mid-podcast, something comes up. Oh, okay. All right, we got to fix that. Yeah. <laughs> You're good. Um, no worries. Anyway, um, I think the dorm experience was a big thing, like, living with someone in a room and doing laundry and all that, and living, like, nine-hour time difference from your family, is that was rough. Um, but then I came back my spring semester, and that's when I started, like, enjoying it a lot more and just, like really ex- like grateful for the experience it just took a couple months to like get adjusted and get used to it all so yeah that second semester a lot of people say that at least on my team because yeah. in the fall we're in season the spring yeah. you're not the, is the spring when you're usually getting used to things i would say so yeah i think the full semester for us is like grind mode like it's just day in day out like tough and when the spring is when we go to training camp in hawaii so that always helps and that's when the fun meet starts and when pack 12s and um like Stanford dual meets and you know USC dual meets and that's when like the fun stuff happens so that's always like if you if you get through the full semester and then the like then I think the pressure goes up for sure but it's also when the fun like more comes up yeah yeah, yeah. I I asked that because since this was my first spring semester yeah. and it's honestly the first year that I feel like I belong at Cal yeah. and that I feel normal and it's yeah. like yep I, I think that's what I've been missing yeah I mean we've we don't have like a off season unfortunately i think with swimming it's like so year round um but it is like when the cool things happen of like conference and ncaa's so that's when i experienced all those things for the first time so that was pretty cool yeah that's awesome and in terms of the student athlete balance Mm -hmm. with academics um first off like how was that experience like in terms of the language which you already knew how to speak english obviously but just the academic yeah. culture of student athlete was that weird for you at first? Um, yeah, I would say though I've always like been adjusted to combining academics and swimming because I've wanted to do those both at, like well. But I did have like a tutor my first semester here who taught me more like academic English because I'd only like speaking English versus writing an essay and like preparing and knowing the ins and outs of English like academic stuff. So the ASC definitely helped me with that, but. Um, I would say within pretty quickly, I got the hang of it. Um, and I think it's, you know, you come to college and all of a sudden you can choose your own classes. I love that. Like, okay, I can choose what I want to do. I'm not being forced to take whatever. Um, so that was, I mean, it was hard and I definitely in the beginning 
would read every single sentence and like I would have to come prepared because in my head I've always because of the language barrier I would like over prepare just so that I wouldn't like not know a certain word in that language or whatever um so I definitely way overdid it my freshman year and then sophomore year I was like okay I can I can take it a little chill <laughs> I can take it a little easier and still be fine so yeah and did you always want to do global studies? Yeah, I did. Okay. Yeah. Cool. I So I've always wanted to do, like, something with international relations. Glo Berkeley, like, it has international relations in the political science department, but I didn't want to study political science because then I would also have to do, like, American politics. And I was like, um, interesting. But, I mean, Trump was president at the time, so I was like, okay, there's a lot going on, which is interesting. But I was always, I just wanted to focus on Europe. Um, even though I was in America, I definitely took like classes that taught me about America and like American history and stuff like that. But then I found out about global studies and it was peace and conflict studies and international relations. That's the combination. I was like, perfect. That's what I want to do. Yeah. yeah. Cause even in poli sci, like, which is what I'm doing right now, yeah. I think that like people don't realize how little of a role the president has in American politics. It's the face, yeah. but it's not like... Yeah the main person yeah. doing everything and making decisions yeah. but at the same time that's always the examples they use right now in my classes like it's always the difference between trump and biden yeah. and it's it gets so annoying yeah. right now so and i i didn't want to be as theory heavy because i think poli sci is pretty like theoretical for at least from like what the research that i did and global studies is much more we're going to take the issues and like of the world or whatever historical contemporary and then like how do we, what went wrong, how do we change it, what can we do better, like, in the future, that's kind of what I would say global studies is, and I was like, okay, it's much more, like, real to, like, day-to-day, -day, like, examples, and I was like, I don't want to be as, like, theory-heavy, so that's why I chose global studies, yeah. So you're more into the policies? Yeah, I would say policies, but also, like, more the NGO, like, type of world, like, or, like, the international, like, the foreign affairs, like, world, so stuff like that, um, I just didn't want to know about, like, certain political like theories as much but i've definitely taken like some poly like public policy classes as well yeah okay yeah. interesting yeah. i feel like if we divide it into three categories of why how what yep you're probably more into the how part like how things go yes. about yeah and yeah. i'm more on the why which is the yep. theory exactly philosophical yep. part that's that's exact that's perfect that's a very good <laughs> description of that yep yeah yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. well th well that's awesome and Adjusting to the team, you said, like, you, you learn from people like Abby, for mm -hmm. example, of, wow, they can have fun or things yep. like that. How was that experience, as well as with um, NCs, for example, or Pac-12s, like, the difference I've seen with some international students versus domestic, like, just growing up here, people dream of being college swimmers their entire lives. Yeah. They dream of, oh, a Pac-12, yep. NCs, go to Cal, <laughs> yep. things like that. How long did it take you to understand that? It took me a while. I think I I think I first really understood that in season 2018. Um, I I mean, I was definitely a freshman. My team also really, you know, treated me like a freshman, as they should. I think that's super normal because back then I was like, ah, I know so much. Like, as most freshmen come in, they're, like, thinking they know so much, but we really don't because, you know, going – swimming in a team is super different than swimming for yourself or even, like, swimming for your country, at least in the Netherlands because it's pretty individually based. Um, so I had to learn what, like, being in a team, what that meant, and I think you have, especially people who come to Cal, they're all probably the best of the best, and everyone, like, comes together, and that's, I think, why it was important to, like, be treated like a freshman, because even though, yeah, I'd been to the Olympics, like, I'd never been to NCAA, so I had no idea what that meant, um, but yeah, going, I think my NCAAs in 2018 were in Ohio, if I want to, if I say that correctly, um, and just, like, how you're not swimming for yourself, like you're swimming to score points for your school and for your team. I love that because it like, you're doing it for someone but other than yourself. You're doing it for something much bigger than yourself. And I love that. So I remember like, I lost my voice day two and just like screaming. I've never been so invested in someone else's swim. And I was like, that's so cool. And even like training, it took me a while to understand this, but like training with the people who in the end, like score the points for you too. It's like, okay, we're pushing each other to be the best we can so that in the end we're all like scoring the points for each other and like at the end of the day like for the team and for like the legacy of cow women's swim as well yeah yeah uh i think it was two three days ago ugo gonzalez was here yep. and he was taking me through his 200 or no sorry his 400 i am mm -hmm. like the record he just set right yeah, now in the, at nc's and he was telling me like how 
when he was going through the different strokes, he was thinking of the guys that he was practicing with. That's and, like, awesome. he was, like, just thinking, these guys made me better. It's yep. thanks to them that I'm here. Because, yep. obviously, with the four different strokes at the same time, yep. different groups, yep. etc. But he was just thinking, like, with breast, he was like, these guys yep. are the ones that pushed me. And I wanted, he, he, like, he's saying this. Yep. He said, I wanted to show them how much they've helped me get here. And that my result is thanks to them. And I was, like, blown away yeah. by that. And it's the same thing I've you're saying. I've definitely felt that because me swim the 500 freestyle, which is a pretty grueling event. <laughs> I mean, nothing compared to the mile. Um, but I did not want to do the 500. I was convinced I was a 100 freestyle or 200 freestyler. But she kind of turned me more to 200, 500. And those long distance sets, oh, my God, the, the grueling. So, you know, during a 500, that was 100% for my teammates and 100% for the people who had done all those grooting sets with me and they were the people who were swimming next to me and I was, like, cheering me on by the side. So I did that for them, absolutely, on every 500. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I did notice, yeah, I mean, you were obviously in the relays, as you yeah. have been. You were in the 200s, 100, but then the 500 yeah. came in and that yeah. was interesting. Yeah, so that more really came out about my sophomore year. I would say I didn't, yeah, I didn't qualify for that. My, uh, I did swim it. But it wasn't good. At pac twelve. Yeah. Yeah. So, but I started getting good, I think, in that my sophomore year. Um, and then doing even more. Of, whenever someone would hear their name, like, X, Y, Z, you're with Robin. It would be like, oh, shit. Because they knew I would, they would be a long distance set. So. Oh, God. And so I was like, I don't want to swim with Robin. <laughs> you were the yeah. negative yeah, connotation. Yeah, kind of. <laughs> and, there, and it was same with me with other people. So it was kind of like a circular thing. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's um, kind of cool that you get to experience, like, that individual set yeah. with others yeah definitely sort of yeah well it pack 12s i mean if my research is right I, I again mean, I, you pride yourself on your research <laughs> pack 12s you were third in the 100 200 500 mm -hmm. free mm -hmm. so your 500 wasn't too bad like a third at pack 12s for your first time is okay i don't good. remember that but okay. uh that was already five years ago but yeah yeah i guess so i guess i was good i think at that point i didn't know how painful the event was because i think it was like the second time i saw it so i just kind of went for it that helps um, I did swim at NCAAs, but I think I started getting, like, way better at it, like, time-wise, my sophomore year. Yeah. 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 And even at NCs, like, you set some pretty good points. You had a fifth place in the 200 free and then bronze in the 800 relay, yeah. Yeah. which was awesome. And you won the 800 relay, uh, at, or you were part of the team that won yeah. the relay yeah. at Pac-12. So mm -hmm. that was a good start for yeah. you. At the end of the season, you receive a coach's award. I'm not sure what, where that comes from or what it's about, but... I think it's just anyone who the coaches think have, like, shown, like, great spirit or, like, dedication or have improved a lot or I don't really know what the exact factors are, but I won it with my freshman roommate. We won it together. It was like, oh, the two international roommates. And I was, we were like, ah, that's so cool. <laughs> so, yeah, that was pretty awesome. Yeah. So it's a good start for you. It was you. a great freshman year. Yeah, yeah, I would say. It was tough the first semester, but the second semester was great. Worth it. Yeah, so you're, you're on the rise again um, in your swimming career, especially, as you mentioned, after that chapter with the first cycle of the Olympics. What happens next in terms of, let's see, I mean, obviously it's your sophomore year, same events, you're scoring well again internationally. Where, where are things at there? Um, so I did European long course championships in 2018 that summer. And it was hard like coming back to the Dutch team after like being gone for a year and just kind of adjusting to that and swimming with the national team again. And that I think was a lot of like adaptability. I was like going from America back to the Netherlands and then in August back to America again. So that was a lot of like change. Um, but my sophomore year, I, I loved my sophomore year because 2019 NCAAs I think is my favorite meet I've ever swum at. So yeah. take me through it. Yeah, so we, we almost won. We lost by 12 points uh, to Stanford and Stanford at this point had won I think four years before that, like they were the like the team to beat at NCs at NCAA's. Yep. So and I remember we were in the warm down pool and people would be like, "We're for you guys," because they just wanted us to beat Stanford. So it was very much Stanford versus Cal at this point, and um, it was in Texas, and it's known to be a pretty fast pool. A whole bunch of alumni came, so that was like the, my dad was there. It was like a really cool experience and. Um, we set the school record in the 800 freestyle that time, and that's when I saw my best time. I did rip my suit about 10 minutes before that, so I've never been so nervous, and I've never had as much anxiety. I think it helped me like get out of my head and just like go for it. <laughs> um, and then that I think the final, the 200 freestyle, was in the final with Abby Whitesell and Katie McLaughlin. So there was three of us in that. It was, and then we lost by 12 points, which was really sad. But in our hearts, we won. So. <laughs> 
<laughs> yeah. That, that's awesome. But let's, I mean, take me through that suit situation oh because I know how big of a deal tech suits yes, are and things yeah. like that. For it to rip oh 10 minutes before, that's crazy. Yeah. What was that like? I was in the uh, locker room and it was a pretty warm locker room and Speedo had just come out with a new suit and I stupidly didn't try it on beforehand because I was like, eh, it'll be fine. Never do that again. I now always try it on beforehand, but I ripped it and I was like, shoot. Like, I was like, my, my race is in like 20 minutes. So someone ran across the pool, got an old suit. Like I had four people standing around me. Like, cause I was the, I, I was the leading person. I was like the first leg. So it was like, I, I had to be there. And like four people like, jumping me into the suit like grabbing my butt just like there was no more boundaries it was just like everyone trying to get me into the suit and like running across and we made it on time and then we did really well so yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I mean same thing Kyle Millis was here and he took me through like the tech suit thing and yeah. how difficult it is to put on it takes forever yeah and especially Speedo keeps like they so they came out with a new suit which was just tighter and it had different like layers so the layer like got stuck on one and then I pulled the opposite layer and that just like that's how it ripped and Oh my goodness, I was I was petrified. So I swam that in a pretty old suit, which is like normally you're supposed to like in a brand new like it glides better, it's tighter, whatever. But I swam that in a really old one because I was like I can't get into a tight one right now. Um, so that was kind of funny. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> I I didn't know it was that close between you guys and Stanford, uh, yeah. especially at NCs. That says uh, a lot between the rivalry and things, <laughs> yeah. but. I mean, that, that's cool that you had yeah. that experience yeah. and with the tech suit especially. Yeah. That's, yeah. that's a funny story now to look back it's at. It's funny now. I can laugh about it now. Then I was not laughing at all. I was like, I'm done for. Yeah. <laughs> but, you know, we did really well. We got second on that also right behind Stanford. So that was sad. But, you know, and that I think that me, Abby also like hurt her elbow. So she swam like a meet in like a taped elbow, but we still won the 400 freestyle relay. I was a morning swimmer of that. So that was just a super super cool meet yeah yeah, yeah. I, I feel like i i've brought this up a lot but in terms of references isabel iu is also here yeah. and she took me through that race oh, and yeah. how was abby like, was injured yeah. and, and things like that yeah. so yeah. i don't think i've ever yelled as loud as i have like that to me of really encapsulated like what coming to cal was for like the team spirit like it, at that point i think the team like became my family because i mean it sounds super cheesy but i was like okay, yeah, this is why I'm here. This is exactly why I chose to come to Cal. Like, this is who I'm doing it for. So, yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. And, like, the thing you said, you guys lost by 12 points, which, for those that may not know, that's nothing. It's, not, it's nothing. That's nothing. Like, like I, it's not that many. Like, it's nothing. So it was, like, one person maybe placing two points higher or something like that or places higher. So it's, like, it's, that's minuscule yeah so yeah. that hurt us <laughs> no it, but, yeah. it, it is yeah. one one person like yeah. from the little i have watched and how the points mm -hmm. work it's nothing like really i think nothing. though i i believe first place gets 20 points i believe that's how it is because then it goes really down bad. i don't know this and i'm a fifth year <laughs> but i i do know like relays are twice as many points so like a relay yeah. position is super so even if it, one relay had scored one place higher like that would have been way above so it's a very tiny difference, yeah. Well, I mean, if that was the case and you guys were second on that, did were you uh, school record? Yes. But that would have been the difference. How did you feel? I mean, I remember the night before. So fr Saturday is always the last day. On Friday night, we were sitting in a team room and we were like, guys, we can actually do this. Like it all came down to the last day and like how that was going. I was like shit and Mr. Knowlton came because he was like okay you guys could win I was like oh my gosh <laughs> I've never been so nervous but honestly none of us were upset that we didn't win because it, it I mean it would have been really cool it would have been like the chair on top of the cake but it was the experience itself was so fun and we like really just did it for each other that whether we were first or second in the end didn't completely matter so yeah, I think we definitely would have loved to be first. We were even, the men did this that year. They won and they all got bear tattoos. And we were like talking about that too, like that we would get the tattoos and stuff like that. But um, I, I'm i not that upset about that anymore. So, yeah. <laughs> I, I actually yeah. didn't know that. I know they have like bears on their backs, yeah. but they all got it together. Yeah, so all the men who won that year. And so I think a couple of them got it, whoever won this year as well. Like I know the assistant coach got it too. So yeah, that's a thing. It's kind of like the Olympic rings. At least in Cal, I have no idea if other schools do this, but for us, like with swimming, it's like, okay, if you win. I mean, I know there's a people who have the bear tattoo without having one, but I was just like, okay, we win, we do it. So, yeah. 
Damn. No. <laughs> well, I mean, in, in terms of the result, it's interesting that you bring that up because what you do control is the effort. You don't control the results exactly. at a certain extent. You can't control what other people do, especially with swimming. Like, you are in your own lane, and that's always what, you know, the coach is like, stay in your own lane, do your own race. Like, we can't control what other people do, like, how I throw a ball or whatever. Like, it doesn't that – we don't have that. So, in the end, we knew we did our absolute best. So, yeah. That's awesome that, yeah. that you have that perspective yeah. and that you appreciate it that way because it it'd be – I understand it from a competitive sense, like, you don't appreciate it, but that's still an amazing season that you should be grateful for, yeah. because if you can't be thankful for things like that, exactly. you can't be grateful for what's next. Completely agree. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Awesome. <laughs> well, I mean, that's like, from what you've mentioned so far, your favorite meet, yep. a peak right before we get uh. to the interview phase <laughs> of COVID. Yep. Junior year, you do have pack 12s Yep. And... I mean, at Pac 12s, you place better than, than you had. Or, I mean, pretty much the same th- third yeah. place as fresh, freshman year, and you did the same thing mm-hmm. third, fifth, eighth. Yeah. Um, freestyle again. Things are looking good. It was looking great. We, our team was on fire. Like, we, I thought we would have won that year, and I, it's really easy to say that now, and it didn't happen, but we were all, I don't, I like, we knew like it was Abby's last year and Abby was a huge point scorer. So it was like, okay, it's kind of now or never. And we were doing great. We had Isabel, Ivy, like, I mean, we just had, we were on fire and I was swimming really well. I remember Terry being like, what's, what's happening to you? Like, how are you swimming so well? And then we were in the weight room a couple days before NCAAs were even supposed to happen. And then Terry was like, yeah, it's not happening. And we had like 20 girls just like t- crying because we were so stoked about it. And it was painful. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it was that was rough. So yeah. What was your personal experience? I saw that I saw at Pac twelve's your senior year post interview when when you did win. Yes. Um <laughs> that you mentioned that you were back home in yeah. Amsterdam. So I actually I went to Florida for my one of my best friends, she has a house there and they had a backyard pool. So I was like, I'm gonna go there because maybe we'll come back and I was like, I don't wanna leave the States because if I leave then it might be hard to come back. So I actually I was supposed to go for four days. I ended up staying there for seven weeks and then flew from Florida back home. So I had like a tiny like hand luggage suitcase for about 10 months because I came back to Berkeley in December. So I left in March and came back in December, at the end of December, but um, I ended up after seven weeks, Robin, like it's not gonna start back up. You might as well go home now. Um, It took a while for me to be able to swim in the Netherlands. Like it was, everything was shut. And um, I finally was able to, like, in a pretty elite group, we had pool time, which was incredible. And then the Olympics were postponed, and it was like, okay, it's next year. And our trials are in December of 2020. And I was like, okay, well, if I go back to America, I don't know if I can come back to the Netherlands or if I'm going to have to quarantine for 10 days without swimming. So then together we decided that I would just stay in Amsterdam and train until my Olympic trials and then come back. So I stayed the full of my senior year. For all of your senior year, yep. yes, 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 yes. Yep. So I was gone for a while. <laughs> Training-wise, yep. you mentioned that you were with the elite group, but other than that, how did that go for you? Yeah, so I ended up not swimming with the national team because I hadn't qualified for Worlds the year before that. So technically, at this point, I'm off the national team, which was tough. It was like a new, and I had only missed Worlds by like a tenth of a second, but swimming is black and white, so that's how it goes. And because of COVID, like it kind of extended that way, and I had no, pro- no way to prove myself otherwise. Um, so I was training with a club team, which was a new, like a new experience for me, but incredible group, incredible coach who immediately just like took me under his wing and was like, yep, we're going to figure this out. I just did his training, which was very different because in the Netherlands are much more about like technique and slow and long. So all of a sudden I was swimming like three times as much again. And I was like, it was a big adjustment. Um, and I was definitely missing the team and I was doing classes online with a nine hour time difference um, with professors who weren't always very helpful. So that was a bit of a challenge, but came back at the end of December and was happy to be back. (laughs) And with the international cycle, did you end up going to the qualifying stage or no? So I ended up going to the Olympic trials in December, did not do well, Um, which it was upsetting, but I didn't think that I was going to do that great. Like, there were just so many different factors. Like we had someone in the family like pass away and we had um, like a, a school nine hour time difference. It just like wasn't ideal and I wasn't feeling great. So I didn't expect it, but it was like upsetting. Um, 
But then when I came back in January, I wanted to immediately kind of onto the next goal. I wanted to qualify for European Championships in 2021. So I ended up doing a time trial in America at Cal because I didn't want to have to fly all the way back to Holland to do that. And the whole... Oh my goodness. See, this is ridiculous. (laughs) It's just easier, okay? Um... It's fine. I, I won't do it again. It was just funny. It was just funny. So I ended up doing a time trial with the whole team standing on the side of the pool and I for the first time in a very long time had swam a good time again and I just burst out in tears and qualified for the European Championships so which at Budapest again so that was May 2021 is when the European Championships were again okay so so let me yeah unpack that (laughs) yeah unpack it real quick so obviously a lot of things going on for everyone during the fall and the summer and everything um so you weren't like 15, 16, when you were that focused, like yep. tunnel vision, you, yep. you didn't have that anymore? Not as much. I I think Berkeley definitely opened up my eyes. I think it started telling or showing me that I was also super interested in other things. And um, that doesn't mean I like took swimming less seriously. I definitely took it just as seriously. But it, you know, I'd made the Olympics at this point. Like I definitely wanted to do it again. That was 100% the goal. But I also knew that I was all of a sudden in a different training environment than I had been for the past three and a half, two and a half years. And that's not very normal to just like switch up your training environment that quick before wanting to qualify for the Olympics. So that would have been a big feat if I had accomplished that. But it was upsetting, definitely, that I didn't make it. But to some degree, like immediately to a month and a half after making European championships, like that was cool. And like that was kind of the next goal. And then the next goal was something well at European chat. So I kept like just refocusing my goal. And I think that's important is just like taking it for what it is. I was definitely upset that I didn't make it, but then kind of quickly moving on to the next thing. Yeah. yeah and I like what you said about Berkeley as well, like it showed you that you're interested in other yeah. things that you're really good at other things yeah. as well. So I think it's like an important point. I think everybody went through some sort of identity crisis yeah. during the definitely. pandemic. Yeah. Um, but finding out that you're more than just, just a swimmer. Than the swimmer. Yeah. yeah. I think Berkeley has, definitely told me that like you know you go to like parties at home and it's like oh you're robbing the summer I'm like yeah but now I'm like I'm much more like Berkeley just the classes I've taken the things I've done like the resume I've built like it's I'm much more than that and I mean we'll come to this but that's I think it's helped me come to terms with wanting to be done and just like being ready for the next step is like I know I have done other things I can do other things and Berkeley definitely like helped me with that. Yeah. Yeah. Let's let's touch base yeah. on that for sure afterwards. But with the time trial, that was like here in Berkeley. Yes. How yep. does that work? Because you said that your teammates were right there, like watching. Yes. Yeah, so they the guys just did a duel meet against Stanford, and the referees or like the officials walked down to Legends Pool because we have two pools there. So they walked down to Legends because it was a fifty meter course pool that I had to do it in. And we had to film it to have like evidence. It had to be like official. The official like had to like signature everything, and then. Um, I, Abby Weitzel was incredible in summit with me so that I would have someone to like race. And so she took it out really fast so that I would go with her. And then I like touched, saw the time that I just like made it. And it was the fastest time I'd swam since, uh, qualifying for the Olympics in 2016. Wow. So that to me was like, okay, maybe I can still do this. Cause I'd kind of like been a bit of a dip, like long course, at least like time wise, um, hadn't come close to the time that I swam when I qualified for the Olympics. And I was like, okay. Like, it gave me a lot of hope again. And the fact that the whole team, like, they were running the whole 200 meters, like, with me and, like, going like that. Like, I I was doing it for them as well. And the fact that they were there with me, that made all the difference. Yeah. That's so special. I, I'm just imagining it's, that scene right now. It was cool. <laughs> it was pretty cool. That's yeah, awesome. Yeah. Another thing, like, that I learned from Ugo yep. was just how situational yep. everything is. You mentioned that that's your fastest time since the Olympics. Mm-hmm. You could swim that time, NCs, Pac-12s, yep. Yep. Olympic qualifiers, yep. etc. And that's when I understood the formula of success equals time, or no, not time, preparation times, like, just the moment, mm-hmm. I guess. Mm-hmm. And the, it's okay, so success is when opportunity meets preparation. That's what I was yep. trying to say. Yep. I've never understood it until you said yep. that and until you said that right yep. now because he was taking me through... Europeans as well and the Olympics in yeah, Tokyo. He <laughs> yeah, we okay. saw each other there. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And yeah. he told me that his fastest time of this past summer was actually in a meet in Barcelona. Yep. And he said that time would have put me fifth in yep. the world, but nobody cared. Yeah. Because yep. it was that 
I like to say that swimming is magic because there are times when I felt like invincible and so fast and then I come to the meet and then I'm a nobody or when I feel absolutely terrible and have not slept all week and then I swim at best time. So uh, there's been like, it's it's been so up and down and I've come to learn, first of all, that there's so many ways that lead to, road that lead to Rome, like that saying. I, I, for a very long time, was struggling why I wasn't swimming that time that I swam in the April 2016 when I qualified for the Olympics and was trying to like exactly copy that. Like, what was I doing then? What was I eating? I was trying to like really basically copy and paste, but that doesn't work. So it I it took me a long time to realize that I stopped looking for the needle in the haystack. Like, you, you're never going to find the exact, you're never going to have the exact same factors. You're in a different country. You're older. You've gone through puberty. You've you're in a new like academic rigorous environment like there's so many different factors and you can't just copy and paste that from six years ago so it took me a long time to accept that and be okay with maybe I won't ever swim that time again because that time definitely put me up in the world ranking list for sure and I was like okay this is the beginning and then I'm just gonna keep going but you know getting to the top is one thing but staying at the top is a whole nother thing and I've definitely come to learn that, yeah. Yeah, no, that that's yeah. that's definitely very special, especially with, like, the Rome thing. Yeah. Um, again, another person that has been here was Bjorn, and yeah. this, that's another story yeah. right there, right? Yeah. So that is, yeah, I, I've learned that from you guys yeah. as well, and it's, it's <laughs> yeah. crazy to think that I've tried doing the same thing in the past. Something works out, just like you, copy-paste. Does not work. Yeah. No. Nope. So I've, I think that's also like, I would always have the same like warm up routine and always the same warm down routine. I think, how about you like see how you feel that day and then see how much you want to warm up. It doesn't always have to be 1200 meters with the exact same like thing. I think you become a little superstitious. It's like, okay, I did that and I swam really well. So I have to do that again, but it doesn't always work that way. So is it some sort of OCD for you? I think it is for me. Uh, a little bit. Yeah. And I think I've become, I used to be super superstitious as well that my room had to be super tidy when I left to the pool and just like certain like stupid things like that but I've learned to let that go because I'm like Robin there's so many other factors your health like how you've slept what you've eaten like how much school is a factor at that point like there's a million different things at play yeah with how you're gonna swim so yeah well that that is a very important lesson that I've been trying to deal with as well in my life because I'm very OCD like as well um so interesting going into your senior year you get your first Pac-12 championship. Yeah, which <laughs> that was, was so cool. <laughs> take me through that. I mean, yeah. you're on the rise again. Yeah. And just from what you're saying right now, first time we're meeting, yeah. you sound a bit more excited about it, like yeah. you're having fun. Yeah, yeah. so I I think it took me, you know, you kind of miss what you don't have anymore. And I kind of found a, re, like a renewed appreciation for Cal and what it was because I was gone and I didn't have physical therapists or doctors or academic staff or tutors or like anything at my disposal and I came back and I was like wow this environment is incredible and like I always knew that but I think it took me being gone for 10 months to kind of realize that again um and I came back and we I was just so grateful to be back that I was just having fun um and then we won pack 12s which was so cool like as a team um we kind of knew it was our shot because a lot of people in Stanford, they redshirted or were taking time off for the Olympics or something like that. So a lot of their superstars weren't there. So we were like, okay, this is our shot and we have to take it. And it kind of started off rough. Like we weren't doing as well as we wanted to and huddled us together. She's like, you guys, like, this is it. Like, come on, <laughs> you can do it. And I was a captain at that point too. So I was like, okay, I really, I want this to happen right now. And it was very much like a team goal we said that from the beginning even though you know I joined on zooms and stuff like that like I knew that that's what we wanted um and the fact that that happened as well and winning my first and only (laughs) but you know individual title at Pac-12s in that interview I did say like it it was a long time coming because I'd finished in the top three every single time on the tune in the 200 freestyle and the last lap during that event I knew that I like was gonna win because I didn't see really anyone next to me and I was like this is so cool. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that was awesome. Yeah. We, well, you had a lot of points there. First place in the 200 free, second in the 100 free, fourth in the 500, and then first in the four, yep. 400 and 800 yep. uh, relay. Yep. So. Yeah, that was a magical meet. Like, I would say my two favorite meets ever are the 2019 NCAAs and Pac-12s of 2021. Yeah. Those two meets together. Um, we just also, we had so much fun. Like, we were just goofing around as a team, and I think that that showed that we were just, like, 
having fun and just joking around. And then when go time was, it was like serious, obviously, but we, we were just having fun. And that's, I think I've definitely learned that that's when I swim the best. So yeah, yeah. that's awesome. And it's something I'm personally dealing with right now, the having fun part and yeah. letting go. And it's a yeah, lesson it's that hard. <laughs> it's hard. Well, it's yeah. hard. Yeah. Cause I think as like athletes at such a high excellent environment, we want to be able to control everything and we can't. So I think, and even like, I know that I have, that I swim the best when I have fun, but you can't force it either. Like there's certain times like NCAAs after that was a pretty disappointing NCAAs. And I think we wanted to copy paste again from Pac-12 to NCAAs, it didn't work. And we were trying to force it and like make it happen just rather than just like letting it happen and see what, what came out of it. So that was, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, It's like I was mentioning, I've obviously had a lot of struggles coming in my first three years right now. Like my next three potentially are like, my I'm I'm at the start right now yeah. and it's the same thing we have a new head coach right now mm-hmm. and talking with him it's like I just want to have fun yep like that's that is most, all I have in mind the right most now. important yep and I think you know as I was saying like the people who were on my team they're the ones who like told me that that you know and it, it's experience as well like pack 12s we were just goofing around and we won so <laughs> I mean it doesn't always work but it worked at that point so yeah. what advice would you give to be able to get into that happy zone when competing Ooh, I would say, like, know what, who you're doing it for and, like, why you're doing it, knowing your why. I think that's, like, the foundation. And then just, like, being surround, like, surrounding yourself by the people you want to do it for and, like, the people you've been training with and just, like, you know, trusting in the process and trusting in the work you've put in beforehand and just, like, not trying to overdo it and control at that exact moment and knowing that the work is done and all you can do now is just, like, enjoy the fact that you can show to the rest of the world, like, okay, we've worked so hard for this and now we're going to prove it to you guys. So I was, yeah, that's kind of the mentality we took that week, I would say, yeah. Awesome. That's that's awesome and it definitely helps, I think, yeah. just to put things into perspective. Definitely, so. yep. Cool. Yep. NCs, was that your last NCs or did you go this year? I didn't go this year. Okay, that's so it was. That's a whole other story, but yeah, that was my last NCs, yep. Well, how was that? Like you said, it was yep. disappointing. It so. was disappointing, yeah. I think it was hard coming off from like a high of pack 12s and then going into NCs. I can't exactly put my finger on like what happened that meet still, but it just wasn't our meet. And like, we still did good. We were fourth overall, which, you know, was great. We had at that point, like the longest running streak of being top four, 25 years, I want to say something like that. So that was cool. But I think we just had really high expectations and kind of vaulted under those. Like I, we just really wanted to do well. And I think we just put too much pressure on ourselves. No. Yeah. The decision of the fifth year, how did that happen? When did you... Yeah, I decided this when I was in January, February, just coming back uh, from being gone for so long. And I was like, I have lost 10 months. I have the opportunity to stay another year. I'm going to do it. Cool. Uh, It was a super easy decision, yeah. And what was your mentality going into it athletically and socially, academically? We've talked about that a bit, so... Um, I would say I wanted to focus more on academics and less on swimming. And I'm not saying like focus less on swimming, but just not like take it as seriously. Cause I kind of had been toying around with the idea, like, do I actually want to go professionally? Um, in my mind, I had always wanted to go professional, but for the first time I was like, maybe I don't. And maybe it's okay if I don't, cause it was kind of always like, that's, that's it. Like swimming, swimming, swimming. And as I was saying, like Berkeley opened up my eyes to like a lot of my other interests and, um, I was, I would say that's when I hit a bit of a blue was the fall of my fifth year. Cause I was like, I'm done in a year. What am I going to do next year? Like I was trying to figure out, do I keep swimming? Where do I do a master's degree? I knew I wanted to do a master's degree, but I didn't know, do I stay in America? Do I go back to Europe? Like there were just so many questions and we had a whole different team with 14 freshmen and I was a captain and there was just a lot of people who didn't really know with COVID you had sophomores and freshmen who didn't really know that about the traditions and like th- there were so many new people like over half the team was like new basically and I was one of the veterans I was there for a longer time so it was up to me to like teach them that and there was just a lot of focus on that which I gladly did and wanted to do but it was a lot um but I definitely wanted to use it as like a victory lap and have fun and do different things and I wanted to write a thesis and just like things like that and be like, I want to make sure I use the last year of Berkeley in the best possible way I can. Yeah. yeah. Let's break down a lot of what Mm -hmm. you just said. And especially because completely jumped over this 2021 Budapest was right after that. Uh, Yes, it was. 
Yes. How was that experience like for you? It was it was okay. I didn't do that great either. Um, I think I at that point I really felt like I had something to prove. Like I wanted to prove to the Dutch Federation that I should be on the national team. That I even though I didn't make the Olympics, that they shouldn't forget about me. And it's like hard when you're on the other side of the world to like keep putting yourself out there. And I knew that Europeans was like the shot to do that. Um, and I didn't do that great. But again, I think I was like, okay, I'm not swimming that great, but I'm gonna have fun because I'm here. And at that point, Bjorn was there, Hugo was there, Emma was there, like there were, Alicia was there. There were so many like Cal people. And that to me was super cool. Like I had my past experience of like Europeans and then all of a sudden like Cal people at this meet. And I was like, this is so cool. Um, but yeah, I mean, a lot, very restricted still because of COVID, like no spectators, like stuff like that. So it was a difficult meet, but, and you know, in May, so it was kind of like in the middle of like academic stuff still so um but yeah it wasn't wasn't the best yeah yeah so I think that made it difficult especially like coming into my fifth year I was like okay swimming I'm not on the national team how do I do I still want to like keep trying to prove myself to the like the Dutch Federation and I decided that I didn't as much now so and that I'm like okay with calling that for what it is and coming to terms with the fact that I have had an incredible career that I've like made the olympics and i might not have like swam well there but i still like have the olympic rings tattooed on my body and like i need to remind myself that like i've done that and even though i've not accomplished maybe like every single goal i set out for myself i accomplished a lot of them but i think it's like it took a long time realizing like okay even if i had made the olympics maybe i wouldn't have been happy unless i made a final and then it's like you're not happy until you make a medal and then it's bronze and it's not gold like i feel like as athletes, we always want to obtain the highest goal possible, no matter what we think is possible. So I think I've just had to come to terms with like being proud of what I have achieved, even though it's not every single goal I've set out for myself. So This is something I really wanted to talk about. And there's still some things from Europeans that I want to ask, but I want to follow yeah. up on this. The rings tattoo, for mm-hmm. example. Again, there's been a couple of people mm-hmm. that have been here with that tattoo. Mm-hmm. To what point or to what extent is that an identity crisis in and of itself? Because once again, I need to point this out with every single one of my guests. I don't have that tattoo and I probably never will. Mm -hmm. I'm okay with that, Mm -hmm. right? But from an outsider's perspective, I feel like it defines you to a certain extent, right? Like the title of Olympian, the tattoo is there forever. Like to what point is that an identity crisis with the post olympics even if it is until right now or like taking on a new stage of your life obviously it's going to be part of your identity forever but at the same time how do you realize like i'm so much more than that and like a final or reaching for more and more like that's not who i am i definitely doubted whether i wanted the tattoo because i was like well that really defines me as robin the summer and i at that point i already struggled with like when people when my parents would like introduce myself like this is Robin, she's the swimmer. I'm like, I'm more than that. Like, I'm I'm someone else too. But I think it, I only got it like a couple months after because I decided, I couldn't decide where to get it. I ended up getting it on my ankle, like down here by my foot, like right there. Oh, nice. Because um, nice. I wanted it to not be super obvious. And now like when I wear shoes, like you can't see it. So I wanted it to be... I just didn't know whether I wanted to define myself and stamp myself as like Robin the swimmer. But then again, in the months after following, like so many people were like, wow, you went to the Olympics. And even though the experience wasn't great, I was like, yeah, I have been to the Olympics. That's like one less than 1% of the world's population goes. And I was like, I need to be proud of that. Like, if I'm not going to be proud of that, like, when are you ever going to be proud of yourself? So, and my dad always told me the one tattoo I could get was the Olympic ring. So I was like, okay, I'm going to get it. Yeah. (laughs) So, um, you know, I think... When I stand on the block, my left foot is not the front and I see the Olympic rings and it's just a reminder of like, okay, you have achieved this and like maybe you still feel like you have something to prove left to like your team or your coaches or the Dutch Federation. But at least like I know I've achieved like the Olympics and yeah, it's hard. Like with my time, I would have like made finals, I think with the time that I qualified for, but or just just missed finals. And I was like, you know, that's okay. You think it's like it's possible. So that's what I want to do. But I think it's also you have to realize, again, like there's so many different factors and so many different how you feel, whatever. I think it's just if you're not proud, I've really had to learn to live in the moment much more. 
and just like live in the present and be okay with whatever happens at this point rather than reminiscing about the past or worrying too much about the future. And I think I actually have a tattoo. The second one I got says here um, because during COVID, I think I much more like started focusing on, I was too much living in my time of 2016 and that I haven't swam that and worrying about what I'm going to do next year and like all that type of thing. And I was like, I just, if there's ever a time to like live in the now and things you can't control was during the pandemic, because there's so many outside factors you had no control over. And so I really started taking that mentality on is I just want to live much more in the present and be happy with what I'm doing rather than only worrying or being anxious about things I can't control or things that have happened and I can't change anyway, or can't copy paste again in the future. So I was about to ask yeah. you because you mentioned that the yeah, one so tattoo. I got, two. I got two. Yeah. I'm sorry, dad. <laughs> <laughs> no, so I got this. Yeah. So the dot is for now. So it's here and now. Wow. So, and, and the thing that reminds me like that tattoo reminds me of is there's this great little story of Joe Heller and Kurt Vonnegut, the author of uh, Catch-22. And yep. the story goes that they're, they're at this billionaire's party and it's very fun. They're together. They're talking. And just to mess with him, Vonnegut tells Heller, like, how does it make you feel that our host only today made more money than your best novel ever will? <laughs> yeah. And Heller replies, I have something that he never will. And he goes, what on earth could that be? And he just replies, enough. Oh, and, okay. I, yep. and I feel like that's yep. what you're saying, though. Yep. Like, you're in the moment. And it's like, you could always aspire, like, oh, the Olympics yep. or finals or this yep. and that. And, and I'm not against the tattoo at all. Yep. Again, I can't say much because I don't have it and I never will. But at the same time, like you having that, it's a special reminder. Like you mentioned, it's not the 1%. It's the 1% of the 1%. 1%, okay. Like 1% <laughs> is yeah. a big amount, I think. Yeah. But the 1% of the 1% being able to do that, of course you should be part of it. Of course you should mm-hmm. have it. Of course you should remind yourself of what you're capable of. Like people could only dream of that, yeah. you know? But at the same time, I was just curious because... to a certain extent I don't think anything can define you like speaking about politics right a president or a prime minister like for forever at least in the U.S. like you're Mr. President for the rest of your life and to me it's like a human should be so much more than that regardless of their accomplishments like you're you should never be limited to your accomplishments but having those reminders of what you have accomplished and how that makes you who you are and your lived experiences so, is very powerful. I would say the tattoo to me doesn't, it doesn't define that I'm an Olympian. It's like what I did to get there and like the hard work, the dedication, the sacrifices and like a reminder that that's who I am. And like, it's not Robin the Olympian, it's Robin who worked day in and day out to get to that. Like that's kind of, I think the reminder more for this tattoo. Yeah. I love that. And I think it complements the other one so well. Thank you. So that's awesome. That's very awesome. Yeah. Um, I actually got this one right after Europeans last really? year. Cause I, I was like, okay, this me just wasn't it. And I read the book, the power of, I brought one book with me to Florida and it was the power of now from Eka Tolle, which is how I got to this, like realizing during like the pandemic that that's what I wanted. And after Europeans, I was kind of like slipping away from that again. Cause I had been really good at this and like meditating and like being more present and then after Europeans, I kind of felt myself like sipping away from this. I was like, I need a permanent reminder <laughs> Yeah. because this is like, I realized how good it was for me to like take on that staying in the present like mentality. So that's yeah. awesome that that was your like realization and yeah. that you even have that now. Yeah. I think it's, it's very cool yeah. uh, with what you mentioned with like meditation and your previous thing that you had mentioned with journaling, like what are habits that helped you get through that? Because, okay, maybe we can relate to it on an olympic swimmer level yeah. but i think everybody's going through some sort of mental health student athletes definitely are but humans in general so what yeah. were your ha- she bought a journal for us where we every morning would have to write three things that you're grateful for there's so many people talk about it but when you actually do it for a long period like it really you start actually looking for things that you're grateful for throughout the day and like being like oh wow okay yeah the weather isn't great and i'm tired and i'm hungry but i'm at cal i'm like on a like on a scholarship here like i'm swimming outside like it just it kind of shifts your perspective from that and you start focusing more on the like positive side of things and I'm definitely not good at this every day but I do try and meditate I think it just like helps at least in our busy schedules and our busy days like just to take 10 minutes and just like focus on my breath and just like it grounds you like in some sort of way so those are kind of the two things that I try and do to keep that going yeah yeah and again it goes back to perspective as well and and 
the gratitude I yeah. I do practice that as well. And it's the same thing, right? Like for us athletes that are so ambitious and so competitive, that's important and it should yeah. continue to help us like yeah. grow and become more. Because I think it also, it shifts your perspective from everything you want to achieve. Like rather than like focusing on, I want this, I want this, like this is my goal. It's like, okay, you you have this, like this is what you're doing. Like it focuses on what you have and that way like takes you back, like takes you away from reminiscing about the past or worrying about the future and just brings you back into the like what you are right now. Exactly. So, and, and that's the point because if you can't be grateful right now, you're yeah. not going to be grateful when you're quote-unquote you, successful. When you make it, yeah, when you make your goal that you're worrying about right now. So, yeah. yeah. Now, I think there was, like, a quote in that book. It's like, you you can never change the past, and the only way you can change the future is by doing something right now. So that's, I took, uh, that quote was, like, the if you need to know one thing about the book, that's that's it. And I was like, yeah, why would I be worrying about the future when the only way I can change it is doing something, like, right now. I'm going to so, read that book, The Power of Now? Yeah, from Eckhart Tolle. Awesome. Definitely advise that. <laughs> awesome. Yeah. <laughs> Going back to what I was mentioning about Europeans, the question I had, obviously it's extremely cool, but what's the bond like at an international meet with other fellow bears? It seems pretty cool that you, you mentioned those names because literally everyone except to, Emma yeah. have been here, so that's pretty cool. <laughs> you should cool. talk to Emma too. She's yeah. pretty cool. But um, I don't know. It's, it's cool because we are all from different countries, Spain, Sweden, England, Croatia, the Netherlands. I said it right this time. And you're like in your your outfit, like I'm in bright orange, I look like a clown, but um, you know, and you're there, like you go from the day-to-day grind at Cal and all of a sudden you're at an international meet and you're representing like your respective country. And it's, it's super cool. Cause you know that not a lot of people are there and it's like an elite group. And, but at the same time, like some of my best friends are at this meet and it's like, okay, hey. <laughs> and it's so cool to just like run into them. And there's other Dutch swimmers, like there's two guys Casper Corbo and Nis Costagno, who also swim in America, who are like at who swim for the Netherlands, and there's just a different understanding of what it takes to be a Sunathi at an American university and then also represent your country internationally. So that's pretty unique. Yeah. That's such a sick like idea in my head right now of like you guys being at such an elite level, yeah. and it's like oh my my uh, friends my from friends. <laughs> that's hey! crazy. Yeah. That's no, so fun. sick. It's really cool. <laughs> that's awesome. Yeah. Um, yeah, that that is very very cool. Yeah. Um. Well, with the senior year, fifth year, yep. you already mentioned your mentality coming yep. into it. What, um, yeah, like 14 freshmen, I knew that. That's half your team, literally, yep. and the sophomores on top of that, which is yep. hard. You're one of the captains. Mm-hmm. What was that experience like? It's hard. <laughs> I really, I love my freshmen. I love my whole team, but it was hard because, you know, so many new faces and so many new factors and slowly stuff was like becoming normal again but still we had some COVID things and we just like a gray area that no one really knew how to navigate and yet you're being looked up looked up to to have the answer and I'm like I I don't know but I have to pretend I I knew it because I'm like I'm the captain I've been here for four years so Robin knows the answers but I'm still figuring it out just as much I think like no matter how long you've been here you're still learning and that's I think in the end like a lot of collaborative work with my other two captains Elise Garcia and Ayla Spitz and we did, I think, I mean, it was hard. I don't know how other people would rate us, but I, we tried our absolute best and just like trying to create like a collaborative, like inclusive environment and not just like top down, like this is how it needs to be, but just like, okay, you guys, you have a new perspective and you know, they're, they're six years younger at this point. Cause I like took an extra year of high school. I'm 24 and they're like just turned 18 and that's a big difference. But so learning from each other, I would say is like how we wanted to create like that environment. So it was it was hard, but yeah. yeah. What's the process of picking captains? Um, the team votes. Okay. Yeah, yeah, and then we so most years we have three, but the team votes. So you choose your one, two, three pick, and then, so yeah. Cool, cool, cool. cool, cool. <laughs> yeah. Well, um, with with that, let's see, fifth year. My next question was gonna be: I know you guys had a transfer, but were you the only fifth year? Uh yeah, so we had two fifth years. Yeah, one transfer and me. Okay. So that was it. Yep. Okay, so you were the person everybody looked yes. up to for Yeah, because like the other fifth year had no idea. what She was just as much a freshman. Um, and we had a small senior class. So it was basically this, the juniors kind of knew stuff. The seniors knew it. And then like me. So it was like, I felt a lot of pressure in that sense. But I mean, it was cool. Like I was like, okay, I'm creating. I knew I was consciously like creating an environment like that people then would take on later when they're captains or something like that. So I was pretty conscious about that. So yeah. In terms of your thesis, you just completed it. Yes. <laughs> Academically, 
insane resume towards the end, which we're about to get into. Yes. But you did bring up um, like the NCs being a whole different story. Mm-hmm. So season wise, you're focusing on enjoying the social life, enjoying your last few months uh, yeah. in America, um, in focus on your thesis. Things are great on that end. But what was your swimming experience like? Yeah. Like what you mentioned? Um, it almost feels like I never really took off. Like, I feel like you always take a little time off in the summer and then you build up and then like you get more fit and then more meets come and you just get like, kind of like go into competition mode. And I just feel like I never really took off this year because I got thrown quite a lot of curveballs like health wise. Like I had bronchitis, then I had the stomach flu, then I got a concussion. Then I had at pac I had an infected wisdom tooth. So it was just like one punch after the next. <laughs> um, like every time I felt like I was getting back, like something threw me off again. So it was tough. Um, and it definitely, I never thought that I would be in a situation where I wouldn't make MCAAs because that just like kind of never was a challenge as much for me. It was more like, okay, I'm going to make NCs. And then it's like, how, how high can I place at NCs? And all of a sudden I'm like dealing and grappling with like, maybe I won't make NCs this year. Like, uh, <laughs> shoot. <laughs> so I, but again, like, I think in some way it was my body telling me that it was okay to be done that because I think I was toying around with the idea of stopping swimming once I was done at Cal to be ready for whatever next stage in life and I just didn't dare say that out loud like I didn't want to say I was done because it was always Robin the summer as we were saying like I've done it for 16 years and was kind of scared of like who would I be without swimming like how what would my day look like but all of a sudden I'm like out of the pool for weeks on end because of my health and like a concussion right but like three weeks before pack 12s and um Pac-12 just like wasn't great and then I all of a sudden I'm like well I'm not at NC so I'm I'm kind of done like it was it was it was weird and maybe it forced me in some sense to like question whether or not I wanted to keep swimming but I honestly think that was some higher power like deciding that that was good because it really made me think about like okay what do I actually want because and not take the things that have happened in the past four years like for granted because it's like Okay, yeah, I finaled each year in the 200 freestyle, and now that like the next year I'm not even making the meet. So it was like it really put it into perspective, and I'm more proud of those accomplishments because I didn't make it this year. And just like I think also learning that it's just not always guaranteed, and you no, know, like life, you can't control certain things, and that's okay. So yeah, that's super powerful. Yeah. I feel like it's it's a beautiful romantic way to look at it now for how to finish off a career when I was in the middle of it I was like oh this is not why I stayed an extra year for a fifth year but a lot of people now are asking me like are you so happy you like took a fifth year even though you like didn't make any of the swimming goals like you set out for yourself and I'm super grateful I did because it last year was not ready to leave I was not ready to say that I was done swimming and this year like I am so I just needed an extra year to like come to terms with that and be okay with that so well in a way it kind of did favor yep. you that fifth yep. year. Yep. That's, so, that's awesome. Yep. In that way, it did, yeah. Who do you want to send it to? <laughs> A second time. What is wrong with this watch? I'm sorry. <laughs> you're good. Ignore no me. worries. <laughs> you're good. You're good. Um, in terms of what came up, obviously, it's uncontrollable. But how does a swimmer get a concussion? Yeah, uh, dumb. I was in the weight room and we were doing like a standing lap pull down. And I like pulled it down as the last rep. The absolute last exercise of like the weight session and someone called my name and I got distracted and let go and like the bar with 110 pounds on it like came up on my chin and I got whiplash and in the beginning I was fine and then like two hours later I was like I am not fine (laughs) and I sat in a dark room for about five days and couldn't do anything it was a pretty bad it took me like a month I would say to at least like somewhat feel normal again yeah yeah I had a concussion earlier this semester I mean it makes more sense for like soccer but yeah, I was swimming it doesn't, yeah. yeah. I was like, <laughs> yeah. how on no, earth? No, unless you like swim into each other, which does happen sometimes, but it can happen. But yeah, this was in the weight room. Okay. So yeah. Well, in a way, it led yeah. you to, to where you're at today, yes. which <laughs> is a very incredible point in your life, I would think. Like <laughs> the way you're you're finishing up is incredible. Um something that I was telling Nina when she was here as well. I think that from my point of view, like the people I admire, I think it's amazing to celebrate athletes. I think it's amazing to celebrate good students, but I think there is nothing like a true student athlete. Um, In terms of like comparing to 
to other people or, or things like that, I, I've i built this legend in my head of what a student athlete is. And I think that there are student athletes that are leaning more to one or two mm-hmm. another. And obviously, academically, that sets you up for certain societal success, mm-hmm. which is very attractive, very mm-hmm. sexy, right? In terms of athletically, super attractive, super sexy to be at the top of whether it's swimmer of the year, athlete yeah. of the year, things like that. To me, the best thing is what you accomplish. Like student or scholar athlete of the year is absolutely incredible. I think it is extremely underrated, like what it takes to get there yeah. because people are like, well, it's a balance between both, but I think you have to be a completely different breed <laughs> to be able to do that. And that's a legend I've built yeah. in my head. Yeah. Like in my head, when I, when I think of student athlete, that's what I think of. And I think it is completely different breed. So yeah. that's awesome. Like for those that may not know, you were the Pac-12 Scholar Athlete of the Year for women swimming and diving. Um, you've gotten some other awards as well. You got your teams, uh, Warren, Warren Hellman, which I'm sure is for the GPA. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Um, as well as a scholarship. Yeah. Which is, I mean, that's I'm great. I'm stoked about that one. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I'm stoked about all of them, but that one really helps me for the future as well. So. Yeah, because yeah. that, that is a, a scholarship for your master's yes. degree. Yep. Um, and just to as well give it a a number or have people understand 3.95 is insane (laughs) yeah (laughs) that is crazy like you like a 3.95 probably means you got one a minus your entire time here i think i have two wow (laughs) that's crazy i mean there's some pass no pass classes in there for sure but um yeah yeah so and this year i was like i can't this cannot be the year i gotta be i was like this year i was like okay I'm so close. I just need to keep writing this out this way. I need to really focus. So, yeah. <laughs> That's yeah. insane. As well as you also got the award for Cal's graduating senior with the highest GPA. Like, all of these things. I think it's very rewarding, like, once it's recognized. Because yeah. one thing is... that That's the thing that makes you a different breed, I would think. That athletic, athletically, people get recognized all the time. Mm-hmm. Uh, academically, people get recognized all the time. And that's black and white to yep. some degree. Yep. But the student-athlete combination yep. is so hard for it to get recognized. Yep. It is underrated, in my opinion, and I think it's the best of the best. Like, yep. that to me is peak. Like, peak. Oh, that That is you. my... <laughs> personally, that's, like, a dream to me. Like, yep. that is peak, in my opinion. And for you to be able to do that and for you to be rewarded, as you should... Towards the end, after so much work, I think it's incredible. So congratulations Thank on you. that. Thank you. <laughs> what What's next for you? I know you have some masters in mind going back home to Amsterdam. Yeah, so I um, always wanted. So what I wanted, I want to become a diplomat um, for the Netherlands. Um, I think to me, I've always had like that. As we talked about, like the cultural thing, the language thing. I've seen a lot of different like ways that politics are set up and stuff like that. I never wanted to go into politics. And I was like, okay, but how can I still combine languages, cultures, working with people not in, like, the government, but, like, working maybe for the government? And so, like, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs came up for that. Um, and they there's this diplomacy class. So to even apply for that, you need to have lived in five countries. You need to have work experience, international work experience, which I do not have yet. So that's – I need to do that at some point. You need to speak four languages, like, stuff like that. So I was like, that's kind of me. I was looking through the checklist. I was like, okay, that's me. Maybe I should look into this. And so I need to get a master's degree to even apply for that. Um, And I was like, okay, you know, thinking about, you know, Georgetown is the best university in the world for like international relations and stuff like that. But I had a really strong desire to want to go back home and back like to Europe. Um, So then I started looking at options in the Netherlands and I'm still awaiting to hear from my top choice. But um, so that's international relations and European diplomacy. So that's my plan, hopefully. Awesome, 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 awesome. (laughs) What attracts you so much about Europe in the sense of diplomacy? Um, That's funny because my dad was actually asking me the same thing. He's like, why do you actually want to become become a diplomat? I'm like, because it's cool. (laughs) I don't know. It's an easy answer. But I think the fact that you're representing your government, but I don't necessarily want to make the policies. I'm not like super into policy making, but you are you're debating with people, you're negotiating with other, like, foreign, like, political people and representing it at the international, like, stage um, in a multi, like, level governance, like, representation. And 
I think it was to me like it brings every single like political culture and economic culture and like social culture like all together and so many different factors are at play it's never going to be the same days of work I from what I know um and all the people experience but then culture and then politics and economic, it's just all those like different factors and I think having that at the international stage that was like my dream I was like okay that's my dream would one day be to like work for the UN my dream dream would be like to be the UN diplomat for the Netherlands like, at the UN um so something like that but you know we'll see what doors open along the way and we'll see what happens but you know working for the European Union or an NGO or because I also have a minor in human rights so something like along that that kind of like fell into my lap because I kept like choosing extra classes and then I was like wait that's four out of five for a human rights minor so it just kind of like that ended up being my interest but so we'll see where it takes me but um the goal would be yeah to do to represent the Netherlands, not swimming wise, but politically. <laughs> so yeah. that's so awesome yeah. because the way you're describing it, it's you were just made for it, you know. Yeah, I I realized it when I looked at the website of the diplomacy class, as they call it, and like the requirements, and I was like, that's literally me. <laughs> and I was like, okay, I think I'm on the right track here. Like this is the only thing I need is like a master's degree and some international work experience because swimming it's hard to work. Um, but yeah, so I was like that you know, like complex issues, like wants to, to negotiate with people and like see different, I think global studies, especially like you see a problem and you have to look at all the different like complexes, like all the factors and like all the reasons for that problem like happening. And I feel like diplomacy is a big thing in that as well. Like you're in a different country representing your own country and you're trying to represent them in a political stage, but also like get your country out there or like help with human rights issues in that country or stuff like that. So it's, it's so complex and I love that idea about that. So, That's so awesome. Yeah. That's so awesome. And it's it's interesting how you were literally like shaped into it Some from, way, yeah. like throughout your life. <laughs> yeah. it, it goes from obviously how much you moved, yeah. the languages you speak, how you understand the yeah. culture, the experiences you've had, like that all shapes you. And exactly. for it to, it doesn't fall into your lap because you've no. worked for it. But instead of thinking of the goal and working towards that, you just worked and then the goal appeared yeah. and then it's like, whoa. I'm close. Yeah, yeah, and yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, that's so yeah. awesome. And, and the different ways that you can approach it, like from your experiences, for example, I was writing a couple papers last week on the exact same topic, and it was the pursuit of happiness, which is a huge thing in the U.S. It's reading. I actually in, took the psychology of human happiness this year. Okay. As like an extra class. Interesting. <laughs> I was intrigued on in that, yeah. I, yeah. I haven't taken that, and I'm like attracted to yeah. it, but... It's like the pursuit of happiness from a political point mm-hmm. of view, which it's written in the Declaration of Independence yeah. in the American yeah. one. And it's like, what does that mean? Yeah. And things like that. And it's so arbitrary. It's yeah. so, but the thing is, it's cultural. And yeah. that's why I'm pointing it out yeah. because of European, uh, it, it's titled, it's not that it is this, but it's referenced as European socialism. Mm-hmm. And it still is to this day. Mm. And the different experiences you've had, for example, in the US, the pursuit of happiness is individualistic yeah. extremely yeah. and that's why you see privilege so you see such a big gap yeah, yeah. exactly yeah. because that's how we were made and it was misunderstood it's it's super interesting to see how the culture was impacted through history yeah. so here's my yeah. nerdy moment yeah, of the yeah. podcast uh, <laughs> i love it though <laughs> thomas jefferson writes that but when it's printed the first print there's a period rather than a comma as it should be in the original copy and that changes the entire meaning oh. because the period afterwards says pursuit of happiness and that's it. But it doesn't follow along to say collectively in society. And I'm, I'm not I like I don't have it memorized, but it goes on to say how it should be as a community and how we all work towards that together. So when people misunderstand that and then Jefferson and Alexander Hamilton are fighting on federalism or anti-federalist in the government, it just splits up. Wow. Then you go all into because of a full stop. <laughs> literally just because of a full stop That's crazy and that shaped the remainder yeah. of our history yeah. and you go into the american civil war which for many it's like well it was slavery against anti-slavery no it was the pursuit of happiness of different people using that privilege to take advantage of others yeah. and what like when when their pursuits were fighting against each other that's when there was civil war because they couldn't be diplomatic about it so the only other solution was war and that's the thing I'm getting to. Like in the U.S., you've experienced to some degree seeing how people are so individualistic. Mm-hmm. 
now that you understand that, you can go back to Europe where it's much more society based and helping each other out, which I personally really like that, as we call it here, European socialism or like it's community based. But once you understand the other side of the coin, rather than just criticizing it from across the pond, yep. it's so much better. Yeah, that's um, I mean, it's that's why I'm like thankful. I mean, it's kind of weird. I took classes about Europe from America, but in some sense, like it really showed me like how america thinks about europe and like how special like a welfare state is for example i always took that for granted and now i'm like yeah okay yeah that is super special and the fact that you can go to university for free and like stuff like that so i i find it interesting though because when i came to america i think people are much more and it may be pretentious or it may be superficial but people are much more involved in each other's lives in america and you say like community based but i feel like at the airport, like, so many people come up to you and you're like, oh, you're Calgary, or my cousin's third dog's best friend passed away, grand- like, went to Cal, or even thought about going to Cal, and it's like, people are very intrigued about each other's lives, I think, in America, and, like, the fact that, this is stupid, but, like, at a grocery store, someone's like, how are you? Like, in Holland, it's just like, hey. Like, I feel like in, in Amsterdam, like, it's a big city, and it's super diverse, so everyone kind of just, like, goes along in their own way, and I think in America, there is a sense of community, but at the larger scale, it's America's more individual, and Europe is more, like, communal. It's kind of, like, it's interesting to me, because I feel like there is much more, like, a neighborly, maybe not Berkeley, but, like, neighborhoods, like, community, whereas in the Netherlands, it's not, at least in Amsterdam, in the big city, I'm a big city girl from, like, where I've lived, but, so I think, that contrast is pretty interesting, but I think at the political level for sure, because that's, we have like 52 different political parties, whereas in America it's like, you're one or the other, like that's it, it's kind of black and white, and in the Netherlands we have a political coalition, so it's like all these different types of political parties represent the larger will of the people, basically, so that, in that sense, it's a more, like a better representation, I think. Better representation community based and here it's so polarizing and it's one or the other sort of thing yeah Yeah. but not only that to your point with big city girl i mean go to new york get on the subway nobody's gonna ask you how your day is maybe i've just had some special experiences and maybe berkeley is like different in that sense but that's you know where i have and that's my experience of america but in holland people would never talk to each other on the subway so it's like i don't know it's it's interesting. I think at just different levels and different scales, obviously uh, city versus rural, like it's always going to be different. But I think if you look at it on a big political scale, yes, America is extremely polarized and the Netherlands not so much. Yeah. So, yeah. Interesting. Yeah. We, we mentioned a lot of things during the episode right now, like during the podcast that we say towards the end, did I miss any or anything else? We did push back a few, and I think I covered them all. But. I think you did. Okay. Yeah, we went through all my years. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I, I think we've covered most topics, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, well, to final few questions yeah. here to close up, your incredible story, which I, I'm super excited we got to talk about and that I got to know. Yeah. What is your definition of success? Gosh, I want to get a good. I want to give a good answer. I would say the definition of success is no like, it's no exact time or exact place. But I think it's, the definition of success is like the journey that gets you to the result. And no matter what the result is, I think it depends on how, whether or not you gave it your all, whether or not you had fun along with it. I think we've touched upon that, like having joy along the journey, like whether or not you were grateful for the experience, like were there with the people around you, like. I think that to me is, it's the people, it's the fun, and it's the journey to it rather than the place and the result. So I would say people, joy, journey. Yeah, those are the top three things. Yeah. I love it. I love it. In terms of failure, what are your thoughts on that? I would say it doesn't define you. I've really had to learn that like not making NCAAs does not take away from what I've done before or doesn't define what I'm going to do in the future. Um, but I think it's just a learning curve. I know it's super cheesy, but when one door closes, another opens. My dad always loved saying that. Um, and I'm always like, yeah, sure. But then it actually does happen. And I'm like, okay, yeah, maybe he has a point. But I would say it's just, it's a, it's a life lesson. Failure is a life lesson. Yeah. Your biggest fear as a leader. It used to be not being liked. And I think this year I've really come to learn that a, being a leader doesn't mean that you have to be liked by all. I think it's that people respect you. Um, they don't have to necessarily like you. I think 
is but that they trust in what you're doing and that they will follow along with you and it doesn't mean that they blindly follow along but I think it's that they challenge you to be the best you that you can be but I think yeah so I think that used to be my biggest failure but I think now it's just being misunderstood in your goal and your why you are doing what you are trying to set out to do but I think in that sense you as a leader can counteract that by not just like demanding and commanding but explaining and collaboratively taking people along with you in your leadership yeah. that's awesome yeah. very last one the purpose that drives you the why behind why you do things I would say my family for sure and I would say my goal of wanting to in some way change the world as small as I can be but make an impact in those in this world Yep. To leave your dent in the universe. To leave my dent, exactly. <laughs> yep. Well, that's awesome. Uh, you you clearly are doing that and you already have. I told you that since the invite. Like <laughs> anytime I invite someone, like I think there's many amazing people at Cal, like we already talked about. Yep. There's a lot of people that have accomplished many things. So much, yep. But it comes to a certain point where the, I don't know, I think it's 25 or, or, some, or a bit above that guest that I have had on here. It's from my perspective, people that are leaving their dent or doing something different or some some way I admire that, you yeah. know, and your story is incredible. Thank you. It was yeah. way more special now that we talked about it, because Thank usually you. I get a sense when I'm doing research, but you talking about it is amazing. So thank you so much for taking the time. I know you. you have a crazy schedule right now and yeah. a lot of things going on, but I'm so, so glad we got to do this. Thank you for having me. It's been an honor. It's been my pleasure. Uh, kind of sad that I don't have time to get to know yeah. you more afterwards, but hopefully someday I can visit Amsterdam. Yeah, and, if you're ever there, let me know. Yeah, no, will do. Well, thank you so, so much. Yeah, I welcome. really appreciate it. And to everyone that watched on YouTube or listened on Spotify, thank you guys so much. If you're on YouTube, please like and subscribe. If you're on Spotify, please follow the podcast. That is it for today. I'll see you all next time. Go Bears. Go Bears. <laughs> thank you so much for listening to today's episode. Make sure to subscribe to my podcast and follow me on my personal social media accounts for more. All at Fer Andraes. All links are in the description. If this episode inspired you in any way, please help me out by sharing it with a friend to help them leave their dent in the universe as well. That's it for today. I'll see you all next time.